Hey, what's happening? It's your boy Jalon Kendrick here at the Family Chop Shop at our first ever podcast with a special, special guest. We got Douglas Momo Smith in the building. If you don't know, give it a second, you're going to know. <laughs> he is a legend amongst yes. legends, a giant amongst giants. He is the guy to talk to. So introduce yourself just a little bit. Let them know a little, you know, a little bit about yourself, and we're going to get into a few questions and let these people know what's going on. Hey, my name Douglas Smith. Everybody call me Momo. Been called that name since childhood. You know, I'm a greater baby. I grew up here in Atlanta, uh, born on 972 Smith Street in Pittsburgh community. You know, my maternal uh, grandparents stayed on Garbaldi, right where Pittman Park. So, you know, that's my first uh, recollection of being, just being in Atlanta, period. You know, it's right off university uh, in the Pittsburgh community. Yeah, we moved to uh, Summerhill. Went to Capitol Avenue Elementary School, moved from there to uh, South Atlanta, which is Jonesboro Road. Uh, third kid stayed on Park Avenue right by Carver Homes. Moved from there to Four Seasons in 1973 uh, over in the Thomasville community. So back then, you know, you know uh, Thomasville and Four Seasons, it was, it was the place to be. It was brand new, and it's totally different from what it is now. Matter of fact, they just closed it down. But, you know, that was my upbringing, you know. Okay, no. okay. So let's get into a few things. So how'd you get the name Momo? Do you know it all? Well, from <laughs> what my mother's sister was telling me when I was a little boy, and you know, when I when I was born, I didn't eat baby food. Come on, I went Momo. straight to the, man, I went straight to the, to the, to the collard greens and the cornbread in a bowl. Yeah. And my mom used to just mush it together and get it to me, man. Now they say, I kept saying Mo. <laughs> Give me Mo. So that's and how it you done stuck with me. And I promise you from birth from when I was a little boy, man. I always had that nickname, man. That's a hell of a I name. I mean, you know, early, like one year old, two year old, it was there. That's a hell of a name. So so tell me about the upbringing in the 60s and the early 70s. Like you said, like the Four Seasons, et cetera, was the place to be. Like, mm -hmm. you know, what, one, what was your upbringing in that area? Two, what are some of the changes that you've seen over the years? You know, my upbringing was, first of all, you know, my dad was in prison when I was born. Uh, you know, growing up over in Pittsburgh community, you know, it was more of a family oriented. Everybody knew each other. Everybody knew my uh, maternal grandfather, his name Hobie Smith, my mom, dad. So, you know, growing up, my dad, I didn't see my dad till we moved to South Atlanta, Park Avenue, and he, he I was eight years old. You know, so my upbringing was basically with my mom, my uncles and aunties, you know, all one side of my my family, my mother's side of the family that I really grew up with. And it was basically just listening to my mom. She started all her prayers off with, Lord, you knew all about it. You know all about it. So my, my upbringing was basically, man, family oriented, uh, just knowing, you know, about God and just because I had a person to look at and that was my mom. So growing up as a youth in Atlanta without a dad at the time, did that affect you in a negative or positive way at the time, like seeing maybe your friends or whatnot having their father figures in, in, in the picture and maybe your dad? Did that give you like an extra push or extra hunger to kind of like really go go after it or or it kind of like, I got my mom, is whatever? No, it didn't affect me. It didn't affect me because, believe it or not, as a little kid, I remember going to Reesville Prison and seeing my dad with my mom as a little kid. Uh, my mom was so strong, man. She was like taught me how to wrestle, you know. And then her brother, she had she had five brothers that you know my uncles used to pitch in and and take me to learn how to swim, take me down to Pittman Park to play football. It was more of a community raising, you know. What I said, take a village to raise a kid. That's how it was back in those days, yeah. you know. Back in I can remember, in, you know, in 1960. Uh, 1968, you know, when I first went and tried to play football, uh, you know, six and on the at Pillman Park, you know, it was it was just a whole group of people that everybody knew. My granddad, everybody knew my grandmother, knew my family. So it was like, I remember my granddad, he was like six four. He, my mom, dad, he looked down at me and he told me, he said, "You a Smith boy?" I said, "I am." He said, "Yeah, you a Smith." And you know what? I felt like uh, Martin Luther, like a Kennedy or uh, King. You felt special. That I meant, felt that meant special. everything. Because my granddad told me, he said, whatever you do in this community, somebody going to call and tell me. And every time I did something, somebody called and told him. Every time. And he pulled up on me. 
And guess what? It made me it made me realize, you know what? I gotta be accountable for my actions. Yeah. I learned that early. Yeah. Yeah. So when so when your dad re-entered your life around eight years old, had because I don't know if a lot of people know you had a folklore about you, a legend about you that started quite young. Mm -hmm. So had that folklore, that legend started surround did that start it to surround you at the time or at eight years old or was it a little little further down, uh, down the line? And like, how was it when he was reintroduced back into your life? Yeah, well, you know, you know, uh, one of the hardest jobs in the world is a stepdaddy. <laughs> I had a stepdaddy, his name yeah. was Lee Jackson. And yeah. uh, my dad knew about this guy, this guy, but when my daddy got out, he had to go. He had to roll. Yeah, yeah, that's how I was. Man, my dad and my mom, they been, they were married for 62 years. Oh. So, you know, it was it was an adjustment when my dad came, called my stepdad, was like my dad, he had been with me all eight years. So, yeah. You know, I remember uh, I was like, going to Jess May John on Carver High Campus, and I remember leaving school, walking over to Pittsburgh. You remember down that? Down Capitol Avenue, down there to Gap Auto to see Lee. And uh, my mom and them coming over there in the car, her and my dad, and telling me, you can't see him no more. Mm. And, and I cried. I got in the car with them, and we left. But, you know, my dad was is my dad, you yeah. know? And we had the same name, Douglas. And so, you know, it was a judgment, but I learned, you know, and adapted. At eight years old, I would just really start playing basketball. And uh, and I was really getting to know myself, you know, for that I was pretty good. Right. You know, because I got two older sisters. I got three older sisters, Felicia, but she's not by my mother. Okay. It's my dad's daughter. Okay. I got three sisters, uh, and... Um, my my sister Veronica and Aditi, they they like uh, two and three years older, and those older guys who like my sisters, yeah. they would take me to South Bend Park, Jawland Park to play sports. <laughs> yeah, and that's how I learned how to play that's sports. That's how you play. That's how I learned how so, to play. So, when did the folklore begin? The legend of, of Momo as a teen, because we ain't even gonna get into high school yet as a teen, like. I remember Coach Shepard, who coached me, who I know, um, you know, he spoke very highly of you. Very. Like, you were the best Dr. player. That, yeah, you were the best player that he had ever seen. Yeah. And that was that was interesting to me because he used to train me over at Ben Hill Park, and uh, him and my, my dad were pretty good friends. And you're talking about years and years later, and he gave nobody credit. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It was right. hard for anybody to impress him. And he always seemed to compare them to Momo. And I was just like, man, who is this Momo <laughs> guy? Man, this guy must have been a killer. And so you're talking about 20 plus 30 years difference in our age. Right. And I'm still being told about Momo, Douglas Smith. You know what I mean? So like, yeah. when did that folklore and that legend start for you as a teen? And what did it? Was it a game? Was it a dunk? Was it your physique? What was it? I was 10 years old, you know, playing at South Bend Park, you know, and see what's, what groomed us is like when I was at Jesse Mae Jones, you know, when I was like, you know, eight and nine, we played two games of basketball. We played one at Old Roosevelt High School, okay. which South Side. Yeah. Then we'll play, play there in the morning. Then we would go down to uh, Butler Street Y and play in the evening. So doing basketball, we played two games a day every Saturday. And so that started it right there. And then, uh, so when we moved to uh, Thomasville for a season in 73, I was 10 years old. They didn't allow us to go to uh, Thomasville Elementary School, which is five minute walk. They bust us to Lakewood Heights. Why was that? There was no black kids at Lakewood. Wow. So they bust us. So you know, Tanner Corner, Lakewood, I'm gonna say Thomasville, four season. Then you got over here where the gym at. I stayed right there. Uh, by Town and Corner. They bust us to Lakewood Heights Elementary School. So upon going to Lakewood Heights, you know, you got Whitehead Boys Club. So I started playing basketball and football at Whitehead. And uh, that's when it started. You know, we played, uh, we had to fight the white kids every day, you know. When you you like, hey, you in the field grade, he in the field grade. All right, so you get down here, we gonna do, uh, <laughs> 
hell, you lay on the ground, he lay on the ground, hell me in face, just coach blow the whistle, y'all get up and y'all going at it. Let's get it. So we get going, get, you know, and the guy, he a lineman, and I'm a, like a running back. Yeah. Yeah, but I was big for my size, so they paired us up. I whooped him. And so the coach like, hey, y'all want to go at it again? He was like, nah. I was like, let's go at it. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm over in four seasons, man. We're over there. We going at it over there. All day long. All day long with Tomerville boys and Leela Valley, you know, John Burton, North South kids. Hey, man, let's go. So I had got groomed by some older cats, you know, that was two and three and four years older than me. Gary, guy like Gary Wright, you know what I'm saying? He's two years older than me, you know. And, and, and guys like, 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 uh, you know, my cousins, you know, that was older than me, Hobie Smith, Bernard. So it started with just knowing that I had the ability to really shine because I did it against guys that were three and four years older than me. Mm-hmm. So when the kid my age, it was child abuse. He stood no chance. Yeah, I, I really did them real bad. Yeah. So, you know. And it just continued, but I stayed humble to the point where I never looked down on no one. Right. My mama didn't raise me like that. So the guy who's uh, might have been the lowest on the bench or something like that, I treat him with love, man. I always have treated people with love, and that was just a God blessing. But I knew I could score 50, 60 points, you know, easy. And I, I was doing it. Again. So when I got in the seventh grade, Coach Shepard sent some people up to my elementary school at Lakewood and said, who is this Momo? Bring him down here and play me if he's so good. Brian. I'm in the seventh grade. I went to the school, right? And uh, down to Fulton High School, and me and Coach Shep played a one-on-one, and I beat him. In I was in the seventh grade. grade. Beat him. I ended up playing for Fulton High eighth and ninth grade team, the guys who don't make B team and all that. In the seventh grade, I played for Fulton High eighth and ninth grade team. And I was the MVP. Oh, oh! I couldn't even go to the banquet because I was in school, yeah. in the elementary school. Yeah. But I was in the seventh grade, and I was the MVP at uh, Fulton High School, eighth and ninth grade team. And uh, I didn't play rec ball. I stopped playing rec ball when I was uh, when I was uh, what in the sixth grade. Dang. So 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 now. In high school basketball, right, when you're a stellar athlete like yourself, even myself, I went to I went to Wheeler High School, my senior year. I know about Wheeler. Yeah, which is definitely out of my district. I, I grew up in College Park on the south side, so right. I went to a school that was 45 minutes away, mm-hmm. right? Easy. Yep. So there, there's a bit of a difference between your time and my time. One, segregation. Two, were, were schools recruiting players Mm-hmm. Back then, like they are now, right? And 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 before you and while you're answering that, were you recruited to go to Fulton High, or was that in your district? And like, had you had you you know done it all over again, would you have gone to Fulton High? Yeah, I was I was definitely recruited. Cause my <laughs> sisters Fulton. went to Price. Oh, okay. they went so to Price High School. You were zoned to go to Price. No, I was zoned to go to Fulton. Okay. Because but when I was in South Atlanta, before we moved over to Four Seasons from Jonesboro Road, I was de- I was I was in the district of Price and Carver High. Mm-hmm. I was gonna go to Carver High because Coach C. C. Jones was always at me. You yeah. know he legendary. Yeah. C. C. Jones, legendary. I never Carver. heard of him. Coach C. C. Jones. Basketball, or basketball, basketball, straight basketball. He coached Tommy Ursher. You talking about? Uh, uh, um, Stallworth, man, you talking about uh Curtis Jackson Ooh, with the legend. stick man, yeah, man, you talking about you talking about uh uh um Stanley Woods, Mokey, Robert Harris, man, legend. He didn't get the cho- he they won the they Momo. won the state in basketball back in sixty eight. Co- he didn't get the coach Momo. No, cause what happened was Alvin Neeson, the great Alvin Neeson, whose uh niece was Ruben Neeson, who worked at for the city down at South Bend Park. I mentioned South Bend Park when I went to Lakewood. I would go play basketball at South Bend Park at, when in, in the ten, when I was ten years old and play football at at Whitehead Boys Club. I scored seventy one game when I was uh, what 10, 11 years old. And Ruben Neeson How told long? Ruben Neeson told Coach Neeson about come me. Come on, come on, come on, huh? seventy. I gave at him seventy. 10? I gave him seventy. <laughs> I gave them 70, and she went and told Coach Neeson about uh, they got this kid named Momo, you got to see him. 
You got to see him. He came to see me. And uh, so, you know, I was running back all the way from 10 years old all the way. Yeah. So I get to high school, and um, the coach from Price, they like, well, I'm in the seventh grade. They like telling my mom, because my sister played basketball at Price, you know, please let him come to my school, you yeah. know, and this and that. And because uh, my mom went to Price, my whole family went to Price. I was the first one not to go to Price. So the, it was like, please let him come. And I have a need some reason why I went to Fulton because he was the guy who made me, he told her, he gave me the green light because he coached Stanley Woods at Carver once before mm. Stanley. You know, Stanley was a two sport star. Right. And I went to Fulton where my, my, uh, assistant coach for basketball and football and my quarterback coach was um was uh Thomas Flanagan which is Anthony Flanagan's brother older brother now I heard about Flanagan so they his brother coached me cold blood. Flanagan used to come to my high school my ninth grade year and work with me with my ball handling with the with the uh faking the ball football really? yeah see I, I so got... he was my mentor okay I, I was coached by a guy named Vince Purdue yeah. That played quarterback at Fulton High. Oh, yeah. And uh, so he used to tell me a lot about Flanagan when he was coaching me as a as a youth at yeah. Ben Hill and I was playing quarterback, said Flanagan was amazing. Kick yeah, he was up, he was he was throw everything. Yeah, he could throw the left hand. I used to get on the model bus when the bus <laughs> won number ten cent, you know, and go watch him at Cheney Stadium off George Avenue. I used to watch Flanagan, you know, when he played, you know, and it made me want to be Flanagan, you know. Yeah. I wanted to be Flanagan. I wanted to be them cats like, you know, Flanagan and uh, Donald Brock at West Fulton, you know, and, and but Flan was a two sports star. Star. And uh, quarterback football, and, and he was uh, exceptional in uh, tennis and baseball. But uh, I wanted to be that guy, you know, yeah. and, and I can't leave out oldest Grant. Yeah. You know, this grand at Carver High, he was a great two-sport star. And so, you know, I was recruited to go to Fulton, and I'm glad I went to Fulton because no one had made a name for Fulton. Fulton was like a loser school to far as the sports. Right. You go there, they, everybody, like, sk schedule them for homecoming, you know. Yeah, God, we know yeah, we don't We're going to beat them. You know, and they if they do six and four, they happy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it's interesting that you went to a school that had that type of – history and that type of culture, right? And as you talked about earlier, when we were talking how your granddad came to you and said you were Smith. And for you to take that type of pride and that type of determination and bring that to forth to high school and really almost change the trajectory of what the culture was built on. Because by you going there, the Smith name was held to a, a even higher standard. Yeah. And now Fort to high school itself was start to become held to a higher standard. How was that your ninth grade year? Tell me about your first football game, your first basketball game, and, and what that experience was like your ninth grade year high school at Fort. My recollection of football first was I started on the varsity as a ninth grader. Come on. At quarterback. As a ninth grader? Yes. So what happened, I was on the B team. And we play. I played two games with B team, and uh, they was losing. The varsity was losing. <laughs> so we had this white coach named Bill Chunko. Yeah. He was like, "I'm bringing you up." So okay, coach. My first game at Chain Station against George High School. Never forget it. I go up to the line of scrimmage, and the spaces between the linemen are so big. It's like they can get to me so easy. I forgot the snap count. <laughs> And I'm looking at these guys, and they so big, I was just forgot the snap count. Yeah. So after that, we lost that game. Next week, we playing Archer High. Ooh. And the reputation for Archer was scary. You yeah. know, they would, they, you know, guys get kept back three and four times. They're like 21 years <laughs> old. They got full beards. And uh, so – I was like, oh, man, nah, I ain't, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm over the shell shock, right? Yeah. So we running this, uh, wish we running this uh, wing tee, and I'm faking the ball to the guy named Ed A.G. So he killed him the whole game, right? So, but we ain't scored. They haven't scored. So it's like fourth quarter, and the coach called me to the sideline, and he said, we're going to run that same play. We're going to, you know, we're going to run the, a trap play to Ed A.G., and then so I said, okay, coach, so I run back to, to the field, right? Yeah. And then I said, 
No, I'm going to fake it. So I'll run back to the coach yeah. and say, coach, I'm going to keep it. Yeah. He when said, it. keep it. What did he say, my He said, keep it. <laughs> so, I, I ain't tell AG I wasn't going to get him the ball. Yeah. I was going to make him. the play go real smooth. Convincing. He going to hit the so hole. I, I put it in out of AG and I take it out. AG think he got the ball and he hit up in the hole. I take the ball out and go around the corner. <laughs> And hide it right here when I hit the end zone. <laughs> what you doing? The crowd go wild. <laughs> I show it to them. And they go wild. They and that's go crazy. It. We, we, yeah, we off and running now. You know, we in up six and four. Yeah. In up six and four. But the best thing happened to us in my 10th grade year, Bill Kachanko retired and Willie Hunter came. The I great Willie Hunter. I heard that name. He came. With a tractor trailer full of weights. Ready. And discipline. Accountability. Accountability. We met us in the gym. He said, hey, we don't do average around here. We're going to lift weights. We're going to be disciplined. And we're going to run. And he was a social study teacher, so he was in the building. And I had already heard about him because my uncle, one of my mom, brother, Hobie, was friends with them. They played semi-pro. And I used to ride the bus with them when I was like five or six years old. Yeah. Because I just admired my uncle Hobie, my mama brother, and I used to watch him. And so I already knew of Willie Hunter. Yeah. So when he became my coach, when he found out I was a Smith, he tied that into Hobie Smith. I know your uncle. We played together. I said, I know. And then, you know, he said, hey, you my quarterback. And I was his quarterback for his first three years, you know, because I 10th, 11th, 12th. And that year we went 10 and 2. We lost one game to Carver and we won the region. We won the region that year. That's bad. My ninth grade year in basketball, I remember the first we played Harper and we played again. Bobby King. Do the research. Bobby King was a bad boy. C5 played guard. He was a quarterback, went to the University of Tennessee. Yeah. Harper High. Bobby King went against Bobby. They beat us over at Harper, but I had 18 points. Was he in ninth grade as well? He in the 12th grade. Oh, he a senior. He a senior. You had 18 on I him. had 18, and I was mad because I'm used to getting 30. Come on. Uh, then you still had Similac on your bro. No. You weren't happy about I'm the grown, 18? No, I'm a grown man. <laughs> ninth grade, grown man. I was already C1, 165. Go Rilla. Ninth grade. <laughs> so you weren't happy about that? Nah, disappointed. Yeah. Yeah, so you know. So I, I think it's something I want to kind of brush up on because I think it's important for the youth and just anybody in general when you talk about the shift and the change when discipline, accountability, uh, uh, you know, pride, coach, all those things start to mesh together and you can have the same batch of kids or be in the same work environment, but if you just sprinkle on those things, like the difference that it can make, mm -hmm. like talk a little bit about the difference that you've seen between a team that might've been a little less disciplined or a little less uh, held accountable, a little less right. and like what you appreciate in that transition from your ninth to 10th grade year yeah. and how that impacted you for the rest of your life. Yeah, and, and that's a good question because you know, my ninth grade year, our guys wasn't disciplined. You know, so fourth, fourth and three, they'll jump outside. You know, because when you're, you're not in shape, like the great Vince Lombardi said, fatigue make cowards of us all. Mm. In the fourth quarter, when you're tired, you're going to jump outside, you're going to hold, you're going to miss your assignment. And um, we didn't have that my ninth grade year. We didn't have the mental toughness. Right. You know, we didn't have a culture of – it's the fourth quarter, game tied. Let's close this thing out. We couldn't finish because we didn't have a culture of knowing how to finish. Right. We always was like, you know, they was always like, we almost won. Yeah. You know, uh, moral victories. Yeah. I, I ain't like into the moral victories. Like you don't like the moral victories. No, no, no. You don't like the participation no, award. No. That ain't your thing. No, I ain't, ain't in no moral victories. <laughs> you want the gold. Got to have it. <laughs> so I already knew how I was, and I just put it into the, you know, it, I, it carried over. Yeah. Because when I got there, my coach Shepard told everybody that would listen, when I got there in the eighth grade, he said, we're going to win. We're going to win. Four straight championship, region championship with this kid. 
We're going to win. Yeah, guess what? What y'all do? We won four straight. <laughs> So, we won the region in basketball, my 9, 10, 11, and 12. Four straight. Grand. Four straight. So we got a buy in three, and we had to fight through it my junior year. We had to fight through it. Yeah. Yeah, we, you know what I'm saying? But every year we had a buy, except my uh, junior year. So, te- so tell me about, you know, you know, I have the luxury of talking to you more than a lot of our viewers going to speak with you. So one thing that sits, sits in my soul is, is the game where you guys were down at halftime, and they started, the coach went to the board. And he started right run, against, run against Decatur. Yeah, run us down that. that now, might, who, now, who did Decatur have at the time? They had Dow Gresham. They had Melvin Hollywood Howard. Hollywood Howard. Went to UGA. Went to UGA. Bad left boy. hand. Yes, sir. Uh, Parade All American. Yeah. He was I a heard 10th he was grader. McDonald's. Parade All American two years yeah, in a row. Yeah, yeah. He 10th grade. He gave you a tough time. Gave me a tough time. Right before halftime. time. I went to block his shot up at Georgia Tech in the quarterfinal. I went to block his shot on this side of the backboard, and he brought it back down and shot it over because I forgot he was left hand. He did me bad. Yeah. He showed it to me over here, and he brought it over there. And I said, because I went to pin him up against the backboard, and when he did that, I said, oh, man, I forgot. You know, <laughs> yeah. he left hand. Yeah. So we was down by 13 points. My senior year, he's 10th grade, yeah, him and Darrell. So – we walking through the uh, through the corridor, going back up to the locker room, and I hear uh, Atlanta Public School uh, administrator say, "Another Atlanta Public School about to lose." You Who's down him. by thirteen at halftime? I heard him. You heard him. And now, my I know the history of Atlanta Public School because I'm a Atlanta Public School kid from yeah. elementary all the way. So I know the history of watching Carver and Price and. Archer and, you know, West Fulton, Thero, Douglas, you know, those schools, you yeah. know. But, you know, some of them won it. Yeah. You know, like Southwest with Flanagan, they won state. Okay. And West Fulton with Donald Brock and Ricky Brown, they won state. So I hear this, and I go upstairs, and Coach Shepard, he's on the chalkboard, right? Yeah. And he's, like, doing the X's and O's. And I go and whisper to him. I said, Coach, I just heard a one Atlanta Public School administrator said another Atlanta Public School about to lose. Didn't lose. You whispered that to him while I he was writing that to him. And he stopped in mid, mid-sentence. He said, what? I said, yeah, Coach, they saying another Atlanta Public School finna lose because we down by 13. You know, they thinking that. Yeah. And uh, Coach said, with a cuff where yeah. bump the exit and O. Get a damn ball to Momo. And he knocked all the Coca Colas on all the other kids, right? Go get them. And we run out there, man. And I get, I, I might have had by that, that, that second half, I might have had by 26. Yeah. Yeah. And we won, you know. He said, bump the X and O. Yeah, get, get a ball, ball to Momo. Momo. And then I was like, hey, coach, you know what I mean? Coach, just sit down, eat some popcorn, baby. Come finna give you a show. That's what I did. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? I got a bank shot, 15 foot bank shot, nobody in front of me. Nobody. I'm running. And I tell you. You got a layup. I could have shot one. What but you my do? Confidence Stop in my confidence, I stopped and told a co while I'm going by and bouncing off the backboard. Go <laughs> ride hard. And when I goes up, I can see the people in 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 uh Georgia Tech. I can see them say, "If he shoot this, I'm leaving." <laughs> and I can see them rising as I'm rising, yeah. and I kiss it off the glass. Yeah. Fifteen out, and the cars went up like that. Cash down. money. Probably we were down by down by six, cause like I said, we were down by five, cause um. We was down by seven. We was down by five. But hey, we came back and beat them. Came back and beat them. Came so, back and beat so, them. So, 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 from my understanding, that there was, there was, there's also a legend that they used to mark you for a certain amount of point before you got off the bus. Before I got off the bus, the score keeper pencil in twenty five. I ain't even shot it yet. I had that at half time. Twenty five guaranteed. I'm gonna get twenty. That's what. When you ask me if I hit twenty five, <laughs> one one of my friends said, "Man, how many ass I ain't have but twenty five." He was like, what? Because I was mad. Yeah. He was like, man, what's wrong with you? Man, I ain't hit with 25. Pissed. I'm mad. He like, man, I wish I could hit. He said, why you mad? I said, I thought I had 50. <laughs> so, 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 during your, during your high school tenure, who was the toughest player that you played against? And you, and that can go, 
you know, it may be hard to say that in football, but I, in basketball, you usually have matchups. So I guess, you know, let's talk about basketball, your toughest comp opponent in basketball, and then maybe we can go your toughest team that you played against yeah. in football. Yeah, well, football, hands down, my toughest team was Archer High School. They had Barry Little. Yeah. They had Astro. They had, they had some real killers. Man. Yeah. Yeah, they had some killers. Now, were you ever able to beat Archer High School? Beat them three times. Beat them by 9th, 10th, and 12th. They beat me one time, eight to seven over at Cheney. We were both nine and oh. My junior year, full, my school was nine and oh. Archer was nine and oh. Do the research, ask anybody about one of the greatest high school football games ever. 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 Was 1980, technically 79, because you know football be that, yeah. you know. 79, 80. I come out in 81, but. My 11th grade year, we was 9 0. We had me, Jane Wing. We were loaded. We were just coming off uh, losing in the, uh, in the uh, state playoff against East Rome, my 10th okay. grade year. So the next year, we went 10 2, my 10th grade year. We lost in the playoff to East Rome. My 11th grade year, we went 9 0. Played Archer High at China Stadium. We was up 70 the whole game. They tied the score up and went for two. Barry Little, Archer High School, Coach Jordan. Yeah. Was, yeah, but I beat them my ninth, 10th, and 12th grade. 12th grade, yeah. Yeah. And uh, they were, he was ready for me to leave. He invited me to their uh, they banquet. My senior year, he, he invited me to their banquet. He was, I was, they, 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 yeah, they, they, their whole nightmare. practice was scheduled around me. Worst nightmare. That's what they said. They said, man, when we played y'all, man, he said, man, we our whole practical. We ran the wishbone. Yeah. And my periphery was so dangerous, I ride that full back way from here and look like he got that ball, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, but in basketball, my toughest opponent was Jane Banks from Smith High School. Jane Banks played now, at the University Smith of Georgia. School? Smith High School was over in Summerhill, right by... Uh, King King Elementary School okay, by okay. Cheney Stadium, yeah. right there. Okay. They they closed Smith and Roseville and made South Side South Side. Okay. Yeah. So it was right there by Grand Park. Okay. I yeah, right exactly. George Avenue. So Jane Bank was a parade All American, McDonald All American. He went to University of Georgia. Jane Bank, look him up. Six seven, uh, small four. He was dangerous. Jane was one of my tough opponents, as well as Otis Grant over at Carver, and um, you know Sadell Three. Yes. Yeah, yeah, three. yeah. We were playing against, and uh, but I can't leave out, man. Uh, Tony Stroger, Anthony Stroger, uh -huh. and Money Poole over at Doug. They was tough. They beat me. They was tough. What yeah. now? What made these guys tough? Tough opponents for you specifically? Because they had help. You know, they, they had people Mono, that, Imano. Yeah, they check them. They had four, they had three and four people on me and everything, man. They, you know, and uh <laughs> but but without without omitting this cat, he went to Lake Shore named Spike. Yeah. Yeah, last name Burks, he was dangerous, man. They beat us in the uh they beat us in the uh semis in the state my junior year. And what he told them, because I played against him, he was at Allen Temple. Okay. When they had a gym yeah, over there, and I played at, yeah, Temple. I played at, uh, I played at South Bend, and uh, we used to play them. And he told them when I met him in the state, and uh, he was like, "Hey man, we can hold, we can hold this cat to thirty five. We can hold Momo to thirty five. We're doing good." And uh, true story, you look him up, uh, Spike Burger. Go on Facebook, you go on there and ask him. He said, he said, he said, Mo, I told him, boy, we can just hold you to 35. We'll be you right. know, and Patrick Oldsby over at uh, Cedar Grove. He, okay. Yeah, Patrick was a dangerous boy. He beat me in the uh, quarterfinals in the state because we went to the state four years straight and uh, went to the final four my senior year. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, yeah, those guys like that, man, they were tough, but they had help. So if it was mano we mano which one would have gave you a, 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 a bout? Which one would have got Momo? I ain't gonna say would have got me. <laughs> but the one would have gave me, you know, man, I go with Sadell, Sadell and uh, Sadell and uh, Patrick Oldsby and Spike. Man, those guys, you know, I played against them when we was, you know, in rec ball. Yeah, because Sadell used to, used to be over at Ben Hill. Yeah. So so I, I heard played Sadell used to run, run to the gym in a weight jacket and ankle weights, get to the gym, 
play, put his weight jacket, ankle weight back on, and run back to run back down on Temple or something. Yeah, they, said he, so, they yeah, said he was he wide got open. Cut. He got cut from Douglas. Coach Dollar cut him, and he that's why he ended up going over to uh to Thera. Didn't look back. And he gave him the bid when they played him, but you know. Uh, Sadell so didn't even, uh, he was an alternate in the All-Star game, the North-South All-Star game, and the guy got hurt, and they had to call Sadell in, and he ended up winning one-on-one and the MVP in the North-South All-Star basketball game. So you was how, in that game? I, I, I was in the 10th grade when Sadell was a 12th grader, but I just know the history. Oh, so he gave, he, okay. So your senior, your senior year and Sadell's senior year, it had that, had that fictitional matchup happen. How would that have looked? Uh, that would have been that would have been the Atlanta Journal Constitution front page, <laughs> cause I was in the tenth grade when I played Sadell, yeah. and we beat them. They had us by sixteen points with two minutes and thirty five seconds left in the game. Called Dr. Shep and asked, him, <laughs> and I hit him at the buzzer. Beat him seventy six seventy four. Turned up. I'm in the tenth grade. He in the twelfth. Now my twelfth grade hit twelfth grade. We would have had to play that game at Georgia Tech somewhere. We couldn't have played it at no uh, high school. Packed out. It would have been packed out, man, you know. And uh, it ain't being bragging or nothing like that, but I put in the work, man. Yeah, you put in the you work. Know, I was a dog, man, you know, and still is. Not on the court, but yeah, in life. In life. Oh, yeah. So tell me about your college uh, recruitment, like, the, early, like the, the stages of it. You know what I mean? Before you went to Ohio State, before, you know, you committed to Coach Earl Bruce, right? Yeah, Earl before, Bruce. Yeah, before you committed to Coach Earl Bruce, what were your final three or five that you were kind of like deciding between? See, it was tough. My recruiting because I was 13 All-State in basketball and football my junior and senior year. So you I ain't say honorable like, mention. You first team. Oh, no. Coach Shep said the basketball, all when they voting for the All-State uh, all team, Coach Shep said, uh, you know how you just got an anonymous player? Yeah. Coach Shep said he automatically said, hey, Douglas Smith, let's get that out of the way. <laughs> get him out of yeah, the way. Yeah, he in. And let's talk about the other four. Yeah, yeah that, we already know Smith from Fulton is in. We can talk about that's, that. That's guy. everybody, yeah. But, you know, it was tough because, you know, I love basketball more than I did football. Mm. But, you I didn't have no uh, uh, family member or – a uh, father or somebody who played sports. My dad didn't play sports. Um, to tell me, you know, during the recruiting process, you know, this, this, and that. Right. I ain't have that. Right. Yeah, so uh, my recruiting, I started out being recruited by Tennessee, Georgia, for football and basketball. They Tennessee, wanted you to be a two, both. two players. Georgia yeah. Tech, uh, North Carolina, you name it, Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio State, Florida State, everybody wanted me to play both sports. And um, I used to be over in four seasons. I was a little boy running around with my friend named Gary Wright. We used to run around. And, you know, back to movie Cornbread early me. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, movie. so, you know, with Jamal Wilkes. So I used to run through that, dribbling the ball in the rain, you know, and running the football. And I used to be like, Ohio State, because I used to watch Ohio State Michigan game. On TV, and I used to, you know, um, you know, uh, Jack Tatum, yeah, Neil Cozy, okay, Archie Griffin, Jesse Owen, you know, Archie Griffin, only two time Highland Trophy winner, uh, Jesse Owen, you know, track star at Ohio State, uh, Paul Warfield. That list just go on and on, man. And I'm just looking, looking, looking. And so when the coach from Ohio State walked through the gym door and said, I'm from Ohio State. We want to recruit you. And I'm like, the Ohio State, the real Ohio State be on TV? He said, yeah. And my coaches, I'm like, man, you see one, six, two, man, you 195 running a four, four, low four, four, man, you, you ideal defensive back. Mind you, in high school, my junior senior year, I played both ways. Played okay, quarterback, man. yeah. And I was all state defensive back. 15 intercepts in my junior year, five in one game. So the coach from Ohio State said he showed me his film on why he coming to get me because yeah. I made an open field play. Yeah. You know, a tackle at Lakewood, an open field. It was, it was, it was, it was epic, man, the way again there. But you no, know, my love of basketball, but you know, when you don't have nobody to 
than an adult, somebody that, that been there and did that, to kind of show you, hey, or just say, hey, man, what do you love? You know, instead of choosing the school, go with what you love. Right. I went to the school that I want to go to more than just going to the school that wanted me. Mm -hmm. That's a big I wasn't Ohio State first pick at defensive back. It was a guy named Kelvin Bell from Richmond, Virginia. He was like 6'4", ran like a 4'3". Yeah. Yeah, me and him became, we still best friend today. Yeah. You know, he's one of my best friends. My best friend is Jeff Cargill from Cincinnati. Met him at 82 at Ohio State. But, you know, that process, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was hard, man. So I signed a letter of intent with Florida State. Cause I used to go to their football camps and everything my junior and senior year. Coach Roland Turner uh, from Sylvan High, he took a liking to me when I was a little boy growing up. And uh, so he used to take me to the football camps and stuff. So I went to Florida State football camp, and I ended up signing a letter of intent with Florida State. I was getting recruited heavy by Georgia Tech in basketball and football, by the criminals. Yeah. Yeah. And the assistant coach who recruited me in football was Romeo Crennel, who ended up being coach at New York Giants. Right. And with the Houston Texans, right. that guy, Romeo okay. Crennel, he was recruiting me from Georgia Tech. And, and I used to go there every Thursday night, man, and I should have went to Georgia Tech and played basketball because I would have been in the, in the freshman class with Mark Price, John Sally, that group. And um, I chose football over basketball, and it came down to Ohio State because I opted out of going to Florida State because the coach who was crew me from, Georgia, from Florida State, Kent Schoolfield, he ended up getting fired. And uh, when Bobby Bowden called me and said, hey, man, you know your coach you recruiting you not here no more, you still coming. I said, no. And uh you ain't think Mickey about Andrews was a DB coach and everything, who coached Deion Sanders. Bobby Butler played with the Falcons. He was my host uh at Florida at State. Florida State. Him and uh um he was down there, man. And uh so I ended up going to Ohio State. It came down to Ohio State in Wisconsin. And uh Man, I didn't even know until I went on a recruiting visit at Ohio State that it was cold up there. <laughs> Being from the South, man, yeah. ain't, you know, we don't have coats. Yeah. And uh, But I went to Ohio State, man. It came down to Ohio State in uh, Wisconsin, and I went to Ohio State, which is a decision I, will, I regretted because of the fact that I realized my love was basketball. That's super interesting. Especially given the time, because I guess segregation was still was still a I mean segregation you know was still a big factor back then. So from a kid from the South, to uh, did you ever consider HBCU at all? Um, nah. Which is also you know what I mean which is interesting. And then for you to go to Ohio State, which was predominantly white school, or Wisconsin, which was all predominantly right. white predominantly school, white. I'll, except your athletes or yeah. whatnot. Like how was that experience? And that transition, being a kid, you're talking about soul food, community, your cousins, your gr everybody yeah. being in one place. You feeling that love to going to a school like Ohio State where, you know, you probably could have felt that love too, but at the same time, you're an athlete, you're an asset. It's like when I went to Ole Miss, it's like, don't forget you. Don't forget your place out here now. Yeah. And you're an athlete, so we're yeah. going to let you get into a few more parties and a few more bars. Yeah. You know, but you be a good boy now. Don't, yeah. don't miss that. Like, how was that, you know what I mean, going into, did you feel that or you didn't really feel that? It was it was uh, more on the medium scale, you know, from low, medium to high. It was more on the medium scale because the fact that I played at Ohio State, I was one of the athletes. Yeah. You get a pass. You get a pass. Yeah. You black, you get a pass you know, being an athlete, but it was time, the culture shock was being in a classroom with like two, 300 kids, students, and I'm the only black in there, not even a female nowhere. And it was like, wow, it was crazy. It's a shock. It was a shock to see all the whites and uh, to be the only black in the class, be on a bus and you're the only black on the bus. Um, the racism factor was different. The culture was different up north than it was down south. Cause yeah. down south they'll call you a nigga in a minute. Easy. Yeah, up there he wouldn't be. He wasn't doing all that. They weren't doing it. Nah, but they, you know, they was um, more like passive about it. Uh, 
really only thing helped that I couldn't see a lot of things that other black kids, students experienced because they wasn't athletes. Yeah, yeah. Being an athlete, it helped. It helps a lot. Yeah, it helped yeah. a whole lot. It helps a lot. I got letters from Ole Miss. I got letters from Georgia. I didn't go to Georgia because the way they did Anthony Flanagan. Okay. He was the first black quarterback, and they did him bad. They did him bad. They did him real bad. So I never opened a letter from Georgia. I didn't go to Ole Miss because of that rebel flag. Mm -hmm. So I never opened a letter from them either. Yeah. So HBCU back then, the finance was just so bad, I just wasn't even thinking about them, knowing I can go – to a, 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 a big school like Ohio State, and I'm going to get perks, you know, yeah. going to the Rose Bowl. My freshman year, we went to the Liberty Bowl, you know, down in Memphis, played against Navy, you know, and you get luggage, you get warm-up suits, you get rings, you get watch, you know, you get these gold football pants so every time you beat Michigan. We beat Michigan in 81. My sophomore year, we played in the Holiday Bowl against Brigham Young. Quarterback was Steve right, Young. Right. Now, before we get into that, talk about your first game at home. 80,000-plus people in the stands. Because, I mean, I'm looking at these numbers. You're talking about 87,000, yeah, 88,000. You're you, you a little bit low. It was 100. Whew. We're talking about 102,000 then. So tell me that feeling of putting in those hours with your brothers, then finally putting on that, 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 those colors and putting on that big O and running onto a field coming from the south, coming from Fulton mm -hmm. High, where you're talking about 2,000, man. Yeah, 3, man. 3,000 to 100,000 plus more people. 99% of the crowd don't look nothing like you. And I mean, it's it's on. It's time to play. Like, how was that feeling that first time? That, like, what did that feel like? It was a euphoria. It was, it was, it was, it was, man. It was like I was on cloud nine, man. To come out doing pregame and do drills and stuff, and and it and you got fifty thousand in there, sixty thousand in there, and it looked empty. 60,000 look empty. 50, 50, it look empty in there. <laughs> I'm like, you know what I mean? To go back in the locker room and come out, and when we come out, we run from one end all the way to the student section. So you, it's like, it's like in a stampede. You running across the field. And when I come out, we're playing against, uh, we was playing against Duke. My freshman year, 1981, we playing Duke. My defensive back coach is none other than Nick Saban, Alabama coach. Alabama. That was my coach. Yeah. My freshman year. So we run out there, and at first when we get out, the tunnel when I'm looking, and I see all these people. I'm like, oh my God. And then the coach was like, go. And we run across the field. And I'm running, oh, man. And it's like I'm on a cloud, man. Flow. And if you fall, you're going to get like a stampede. Yeah, you're going to get trampled. Trample. Yeah. And so that was my first memory right there of, of pregame, 60, 50, 60,000. It looks empty. Go back in the locker room and come back out to 102. Just every home game sold out. And just run across that field, man. It's like, man, this is it's euphoric. It's crazy. Now, 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 let's talk a little bit about Nick Saban being your DB coach. Could you foresee him? Like, was he such? Was he so detailed and so like? Could you see the trajectory of him becoming what he what he is today? Yeah, because he was a player coach. Go to his house and his wife cook food, and as a unit, you know, the yeah. defensive back, we there. And we, he talking to us, and it was a brotherhood. It was, it was like camaraderie. It was like, you know what I mean? He telling you stuff and uh, doing a lot of individual time with you. He was just a player coach. So it doesn't surprise you to see what he no. accomplished at Alabama? No, because the way he attention to detail, and it was like strictly on tackling. You could, you got to tackle. You know, because, you know, you're on the second level. You know, if you miss a tackle, you have a touchdown. That's TD. So he was real strict about little stuff, man, alignment. 
you know, but the main thing I, that stood out about him was the relationship he built with his players. That's you know, true. he really built a strong relationship with his player. And also his wife was like in it with him, you know. Oh, and she had his back. She had his back and everything. She He did. He had her included. And, and she knew all our names and everything. Oh, that's, that's And right amazing. now today, the same thing going on. At that She know that, all them kids' names. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. they go to their house and do things and hang out. And uh, so I'm not surprised when Coach left Ohio State and went to Kent State, eventually went to uh, Michigan State uh -huh. and turned that program around, then the LSU. Yep. Then Alabama. I wasn't surprised. It was a wrap. I wasn't surprised. So for you, you won three, three Big Ten championships. One was a, I was a tie or something. I read. Yeah, but you we were co, we was co uh, champs. Yeah, co champs one yeah. year. Was that eighty four with Iowa, but yeah, they Iowa. had Chuck Long. We ended up and going. And Iowa ended up going to the Rose Bowl or something, correct? Is that how Well, that we worked? went to, back then, when you win the Big Ten, you go to Rose Bowl automatically. Automatically. Yeah, it was before now. Okay. With the bowl alignment, uh, with the college football playoff, the f top four, it was before that. So, 81, 82, and 84, we beat Michigan. And, you know, when you beat Michigan at Ohio State, you get some gold football pants. And those started by Woody Hayes. Uh, he was the famous, he the most famous Ohio State football coach ever. Gold football pants. You get some gold football pants. And the and the the the, um, the meaning behind that is back in the day, you know, in the 60s or whenever, well, Ohio State was losing a lot to Michigan. And then uh the thing where the coach said they put their pants on one leg at a time like we do. And that brought about their gold pants. So, you know, I got three gold pants. Yeah. Oh, you yeah, know. you were a player. So how, yeah. how was it appearing in your first Rose Bowl? We were playing USC in 84. Chris Carver was a freshman. That was first thing I was looking at. I always looked at the USC cheerleaders. They were bad. Yeah, they were, <laughs> yeah. So I'm looking at them while we warm no up. West Coast, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking at the chili with that outfit. Yeah. And I was like, man, you know, me and my college roommate, Roy Gray, we was like, man, look at them chili. Yeah. So we looking at them, you know. And uh Jack Del Rio played for Jack the coach for okay. Yeah, he played with he was there. That. Yeah, Jack Del Rio was the outside linebacker, the end for them. So he was on that team. Uh, Marcus Cotton, uh, Sean Salisbury was a quarterback, and uh, man, we 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 played them, man, and that was that was huge. Yeah, you know when we got off the bus, you know we off the plane. I meant to say we flew everywhere. You know that was another thing about being at school like that. You know, and we uh, you know we get there, man. You know, and it was all legal. You know, and they gave four hundred dollars off the rip. Off the rip. Then, you know, per diems. I ain't know nothing about no per diem. Yeah. They get, you know, if they don't feed you, they give you $150. Yeah. Then, you know, we had a hotel with a with a uh, kitchen in it. Yeah. You know, we played in the Fiesta Bowl in 83. We was, played, we was in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, which is one of the richest places. That's a nice place. Oh, yeah. We stayed in this hotel called Camelback Mountain. Well, that's when I first seen a, a, a hotel room with a kitchen in it with yeah. the stove, refrigerator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they was giving us um, per diems and stuff, $75. We'll go buy some bologna sandwiches, some bread. You know what I'm saying? To we, ain't going to, we ain't going to get no, no steak. You try to pocket it. No, we pocketing all that. <laughs> y'all need that money out. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so we keeping money. all that, man. And yeah. so, you know, it was just the, the atmosphere the uh, culture of being out of school like Ohio State, uh, with, that I wouldn't be able to get that at no black college. Right, With right. no knock on the black college, because today now, yeah. I'll get recruited. I'll go to Jackson State with Dion. Yeah, no brainer. No brainer. I'll go down there, or I'll go to Georgia State, because I want to be the first Super 11 they get. Ooh, right downtown in right, Atlanta. Right in the city. I want to start something. Yeah. I don't want to go where everybody already done did it. Yeah. I yeah. want to be the first like I was at Fulton. Yeah. You know, I was the first man that brought the win into the school, that culture. That's big. Yeah, and being a quarterback, you know, you set the tone. You set the tone. Being later. a point guard, shooting guard, you set the tone. Set the tone. Man. Yeah, so it was that type of thing where, you know, I was ready to show to all the um, what came with it.
Right. Yeah. Now, while you was at Ohio State, were did any of your family members get get a chance to come watch you play and experience that? My that parents, my there? parents, and my sisters, and my nieces and nephews, and my daughter, because she was born, she was born my uh, November first, nineteen eighty one. Before we talk the, about that, big, because a lot of young athletes go through that nowadays, and it's scary. I went through it my freshman year mm. of of college, and, and I panicked. Yeah. It was one of the reasons I had a lot of attention with my college coach yeah. because I did not know how to express myself. Right. I, I was sick to my stomach. I didn't want to get out of bed. I just I just didn't know what to do. I got a kid on the way. I'm a McDonald's All-American. Yeah. I'm top 10 on the on the draft board. What am I what am I gonna do? I got another human. I'm 16. Yeah. And I panicked and I and I did not handle that situation well. But I, I also never knew any high-level athletes personally right. that that had ever talked about that and how yeah. to navigate it. So I know you and your daughter's relationship is amazing. So how is that navigating as such a young, stellar athlete and a young adult going from Atlanta to Ohio State to have, you know what I mean? Like that that had to have been. It was, you know what helped me a lot is my parents and my sister's relationship with my older daughter mother. Cause she's they mm-hmm. stayed with us okay. in high school. My senior year, they was at our house all the time. Okay. And her parents and her siblings. So I knew they let me know we got you. We got her. She did. See, my mom, and dad had them. You know, my sister them. They gonna take care of, make sure whatever money that my my daughter, mama needed, whatever this baby needed, they were gonna get it. So she was like, man, you just go play football. We got her. And her parents was on the same, uh, they was on the same wavelength and understanding with my parents, cause they was close. My yeah. parents and my older daughter parents was close. Okay. Yeah, my mom and dad and the day my mom and dad they were close. So when you got the news, you didn't? Did you panic? Did you? Was you scared? Like what? Or was you just like, okay, well this is just just my new reality? Yeah, it was my new reality because of the fact that you know. I, I knew it was a responsibility, but I didn't look at it as a financial thing that I had to go get a job, go to get there, because they had told me what they was going to do. Right. So that that kind of helped. And then by by my, when she turned three, by my junior year, they moved up there. I got an apartment. I got an apartment. They came up there my junior year. You got, they came up. That's called standing on business. I like They that. stayed. They, yeah, I got, you know what I'm saying, you know. One of the alumni, yeah. Yeah, he was a pediatrician. Yeah, yeah. He owned his own company, you know. Yeah. He, 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 I said, hey, man, I'm thinking about leaving, man. I, I miss my daughter, man. And and so they, shoot, man, they, they, I went home and rented a car, man, and got brought them back up, man, and got me an apartment. I still had dorm room, had an apartment. They stayed up there with me, man, in my junior year. And then they came back my senior year and stayed for a while, you know, and and my, cause I was a fifth year senior. You okay. know, I registered my sophomore year. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, I, um, you know, dealt with it like that, you know, and they was there. Yeah. And it helped, you know, it helped them being there. But the, uh, just the relationship building with my daughter was uh, a real serious commitment that I made you know, just building a relationship with her and, and, and being there with her and talking to her. Right. And right now today, she's 41, and, and our relationship is so strong. Yeah. Even though she stay in Cleveland, Ohio, she moved there when uh, she was uh, right out. She finished elementary school. Uh-huh. She went to the elementary school in my parents' neighborhood. Okay. Yeah, because, you know, they stay, we stayed, you yeah. know, they always was at my house. So, you know, and we had an apartment right there uh, off Snap Finger Wood. My parents stay off uh, West of Chapel. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, it was it was scary, but also I had the support. Yeah. I had some serious support that yeah. really helped. So, uh, not off topic, but I'm very interested to know, what was the, what was, being at the Ohio State, like I said, I, I spent the year at University of Memphis, also a year at UNLV, which are both party schools. Mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit about being uh, at a school like Ohio State during that time, that nightlife, and those after those big wins and the Rose Bowl, and like how, like how, how was that? And and not only how was it, and keep it raw, but also 
how would you tell a young athlete how to navigate that environment now? Maybe maybe some things that you would have made a little tweak yeah. on that that you might that you maybe didn't make at the time. Yeah, but you know that atmosphere was was off the chain. I was on South Campus and and our uh, dorm was right there on High Street. High Street was all the bars at. Mm -hmm. You know, and I just thank God social media. You know, one around. around. I'd have, ooh, I got kicked <laughs> off the team. Cause I was, yeah. I ain't had no limits on what I was doing, you know what I'm Yeah, that alcohol, I get that look in me, you know what I'm saying? I transform. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was straight food. Yeah. You know, my friend, they'll tell you, cause you know, I'm out of chain now, sober. Yeah. I ain't, you know, I ain't had a drink in 17 years. But uh, back when I was drinking, man, I ain't had no limit, man. Cause you know, I started drinking beer when I was 12 years old. You know, started smoking weed when I was 12. You know, we were just smoking that regular weed yeah, then, you know. Reggie. You're just hitting the Reggie. We were just hitting that Wayne weed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We were just hitting that killer. Yeah, hit that killer. Yeah, we were just hitting Wayne. You know, Wayne weed. That we had. But, you know, we were just, you know what I mean, man? You know, you get you a dime bag, a, a, 20, a dime bag in that gold bag, yeah. you know? But I tell any kid, man, you know, it's limits on what you do. Because, man, I like to flunk out my freshman year. First of all, I'm from Atlanta and it's yeah. warm. I go to Ohio, it's cold. I look out there doing one quarter and it got snow this high. You think I'm going to class? No. I lay back down. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm so I'm sitting there, man. I ain't going no. Hey, school got to be close. Me, you mean to tell me they didn't cancel class? It got to be close, huh? No. In Atlanta, we get this much snow. Oh, yeah, Everything so shut down. So, hey, man, I got like a one point some average, dog. You know, I feel like, man, I feel like four classes, man. <laughs> my And uh, so my priorities wasn't right because, honestly, I went to school to play football. Yeah. That's why I, I didn't go to school to graduate. Yeah. yeah. I ended up graduating. But that ain't, that was, that ain't why, that I went, why you went. I went to school to play football. Yeah. And go pro. Yeah. You know, and so I tell any kid today, Prioritize, Prioritize, because social media will get you in trouble. You know, you put people put you they. You know, we ain't have phones then. Right. You know, in '81, we ain't have no phone. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I don't even know if we beat, had a beeper back then. Yeah. But we didn't have no phone, and um, people couldn't record you doing certain stuff. So I tell any kid today, man, you know, choose your friends wisely. Choices are free, consequences are costly. Mm. And every day we make choices. Mm. From just what I'm eat for breakfast, uh, what I'm eat for lunch. Yeah. Is I'm gonna go get the oil change. Yeah. So we make decisions all day. Yeah. So what I do, I try to make conscious decisions. I don't try to make conscious decisions. I tell, I make decisions based on not how it affect me, but how it gonna affect others. Ooh. So I don't make selfish decisions. I make spiritual choices. That's that, that peanut butter. Peanut butter, baby. Yeah. Peanut butter, when you give somebody something that make them say, mm. <laughs> you ain't giving them jelly, huh? Now, jelly ain't going to do nothing for you. <laughs> jelly, you can't spread it because it's thin. It's thin. I give you that peanut butter, and you can chew on it, and you can spread it. <laughs> you can spread you it can for spread days. It. You can spread it for years. <laughs> We ain't in today, baby. Yeah. Yeah. So I tell any kid, man, make right choices. Right. Yeah, because it's three C's in life. Okay. Choices, chances, and change. Ooh. That's the jelly. Ooh. The jelly is choices, chances, and change. Ooh. That deep, man. The peanut butter is you got to make a choice to take a chance. Or your life will never change. Come on, huh? That's the peanut butter. The three that thick. C's. That thick. Choices, <laughs> chances, and change. You got to make a choice to take a chance or your life will never change. That's deep right there, huh? And I ain't telling you nothing I ain't did. Everything yeah. I discussed, I did it. You don't did it. Yeah, because God told me, son, you got to change or you're going to be on the corner asking for some change. Damn. Now, now, I am curious to know, so during, during your college, your college uh, experience, when you said you redshirted and you sat out of here and you, your grades were kind of fluctuating because of, uh, uh, you know, just change of scenery. 
Did your work ethic ever change? Like, did your work ethic, did your confidence, and did, did, did like, something within you? And, and, and I'm asking this because I remember myself being a high-level athlete and going through some bumps and some, you know, some shaky situations mm-hmm. in college, mm-hmm. and my work ethic changed a little bit. And it wasn't until I, you know what I mean, I said, oh, wait a minute, come on now. Don't forget who you are. Right, right. And I readjusted, and mm-hmm. then that's when I seen success again. But there was a time where, where you know, I, I mean, I don't know if I had depression or anything, but I mean, I think somebody would consider it that. But I definitely had, uh, my confidence definitely had took a hit. You know what I mean? Because uh, uh, some of the same things you said. I, I chose my college just on, I like this color. I know a few folks up here. Right. Man, forget it. I, wherever I go, I'm going to leave. Yeah, yeah. You know, just that cocky, that cocky. Wherever I go, I'm, I'm rich in two yeah. years. It don't yeah. even matter. It's, it's done. It's done. You know what I mean? So we might well go whoever got the best best uniform. Yeah. You know what I mean? And not really going to a school that was best for, for me. For your fit. Benefit for me and my right. fit, my, my mentality. Yeah. My, my soul, my spirit, all those things in alignment to go to a school that, that was best for me. I didn't do it like that. I did, man, I got four friends up here. I know a few folks up here. All right, whatever. Let's just get it over with. Yeah. So, 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 was your confidence, my, your work ethic ever took a hit? Yeah, because, yeah, it, mine took a hit. My sophomore when I redshirted because they moved me to, from DB to wide receiver. Mm. Yep, so... You know, they was like, you played offense, and we losing two receivers. They gone, you know, and, uh, you know, we need some help at receiver. Right. You know, and then, you know, in playing sports and in life in general, you know, you can know how to do too many things and get lost in the shuffle. Yes, sir. So when they picked me to switch to wide receiver, I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Now I get a chance to get the ball in my hand and do something with it. And, uh... But, you know, I lost confidence because, you know, I'm used to coaches being encouraging, but you had a big school like Ohio State. You from out of state. You got kids that coming from in-state that these alumni, they they talk to the coach, say, hey, man, I want to see such and such on the field. You know, I'm getting y'all this money for this and that. And the political thing come into play, and then I started feeling like, man, forget it. Yeah. No, man, I ain't even worried about it. You know what I mean? I looked at, you know, because uh, I always felt like, man, I can make it without sports in this life. See, I was so confident in my personality that guess what? A lot of you cats, if they don't make it, they're going to be they in the done. crazy house. They done. And I know quite a few of them at Ohio State that was all in football with their life. Yeah. And without that, they nothing. nothing. And that's an interesting pro and con because it also gives you a safety net to understand. It gives you a safety net and not a way out, but it gives you a safety net when you know. It's like me. I knew. I told people, I'm going to be rich. I used to tell my coach, man, I'm going to be rich. Man, regardless, man, you <laughs> play with yourself. Yeah. Play with your wife. Play with your Man, I'm, I'm going to go get it. Regardless. Yeah. yeah. And by having that mentality, if you're going to play with me in basketball, it's like, all right, cool, man. I'm going to just, I'm going to do yeah. something else. Yeah. But then guys who didn't have that type of, they said, man, I got to put all my eggs in this one. And they go. And they go. Yeah, they go. They go. Wherever the coach Yeah, they from a little town, too. Yeah, they go. People speak to each other 20 times. Yeah, they go. You know what I'm saying? I went to Middletown, Ohio, where Chris Carter from, and that that same person sitting on that point weighed at me 50 times. (laughs) I'm like, nigga, y'all don't talk way at you. I'm tired. Don't throw away at me no more. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that they know that's their own way out. That's their own way. And it's a good thing, too. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's, It's a balance. But. Uh, the good news is this: that ball gonna stop bouncing. Yeah. Don't pass on the back gonna stop. Then what? Then what? Mm. I know a lot of them. They don't even know. They didn't even know who they are. Kind of fair Without that stop. title. That fairy tale stop. Yeah. And see, get what? It's hard being an ordinary guy. It's hard going to nine to five. So if you didn't do the proper things you're supposed to do to save your money and put it in uh, some type of uh, 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 account where it can be residual income, yeah. if you didn't make some investment enough to that where you'll be able to rest on your laurels and um, thought about the end game, mm-hmm. 
which a lot of them, they don't went and bought by 20 car. They don't went and bought these houses and this and that. They ain't paid no care for that one house that they can say that they, they own that house, you know, still paying on the house they got mama. And you see what I'm saying? They got to yeah. go back and move in mama house that right. they bought mama. So a lot of guys, they, they not past that. Right. They still ain't past they still So, and so, so I, I, I get what? I'm glad God gave me my words first. So post-college at Ohio State, you had the, had the chance to play with the Giants. Now tell me a little bit about that experience. Man, in uh, 86, I went to a Falcon uh, preseason game. They were playing against the Giants, and I put up at Fulton County State, I see Romeo Cornell. And he was like, hey, you know, because I finished football at Ohio State, December 85. He was like, what you doing, Doug? I said, I'm back at my high school, you know, teaching and coaching. He was like, hey, man, you want me to talk to Parcel about getting you in the camp next year? I'm like, cool. You know, this is a coach who recruited me from Georgia Tech. Right. When my senior year in, in uh, high school. So he put me on, man. So when I get the, uh, you know, Mark Ingram, Odessa Turner, you know, those was the guys who got drafted, you know. And um, so uh, I was cool with it, man, you know. I get that mad camp, man. I see LT, Phil Sim, Mark Bavaro, Terry Kennard, Perry Williams, uh, Harry Carson. I'm seeing a Mar I mean, I'm seeing these cats I see on TV, you know. Right. Mind you, my two teammates from Ohio State, uh, William Roberts, he's starting offensive tackle for them. He was a first round pick. And Pepper Johnson. Okay. He was a linebacker, you know. So I, when I get to the Giants, I'm there with two of my teammates yeah. from college. So it was cool, you know. Right. They got apartments and, you know what I mean, riding in the big boy bins. And yeah. I'm with them, man. I'm good. It. I'm good, Jack. And so, uh, man, you know, camp was good. It was going well, man. And, and man, I'm playing defensive back at camp. You know, been playing the last three years wide, wide receiver. receiver. They put me at defensive back, man, at left corner. So during, uh, during the strike, you know, I started at left corner and um, – you know, we played Monday Night Football against 49ers. We played the Washington Redskins, and we played Buffalo up in Buffalo. Right. Played two home games. So, you know, the whole atmosphere of playing, man, and, you know, signing, getting like a, you know, a $15,000 signing bonus. Right. I'm working at that high school, right. man, sub teaching, man. I'm good. Right. You know, and it gave me an opportunity to get an apartment for my – my uh, girlfriend then and my first, my, my old, my, my daughter, Shatir. So we had got an apartment. And, you know, the money was sweet. I was still working at the school. and uh, But that whole experience, being around guys like Lawrence Taylor, man, and, you know, being around guys like Phil Sim, and then Bill Belichick being my D coordinator, him being who he is right. before he got famous. Right. This was in 87. And then Bill Parcell. And just, man, just hanging out with those guys and just being experienced. And then uh, going to New York to Delancey Street and shopping and buying, you know, the, the Run DMC leather Adidas. You yeah. know, I had about five pounds on the Port Carrell Shade, $500. Yeah, man. So it was a good thing, man, you know. So, so, so we know the folklore. We know the legend. We know the glitz and the glams. But there's a, there, there there's two sides of the coin when it comes to Momo. Yeah. What's the we got the we got we got the the pretty version, cut <laughs> version. Yeah. Give us the uncut. Do give us give us the uncut version, you know, and 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 I don't want to I don't want to hold you back by telling you which direction to go. I just want to open up the floodgates and let you just speak about the uncut version of Momo and yeah. and, and life. Yo, you know, I was working at General Motor, man, you know, in uh in uh 99. I was working at General Motor in uh 1989. So when I finished with the Giants in 87, went back to my high school and uh coaching football, basketball track. And then, you know, 88, you know, crack start coming in the lounge and everything. And so in 89, I wasn't a part of that no more. I had stopped coaching at the school. I had, uh, you know, was just started hanging with guys that, that I kind of grew up with. And uh, in 89, I made a bad choice, man. You know, I choose smoke crack cocaine, thinking that 
You know, I was the first to start on the varsity as a ninth grader. I was the first to be student council president as an athlete at my school. Mm. I had done a lot of firsts. And insane as it sounds, man, I wanted to be, you know, once I they was like, man, you smoke crack, you ain't going to go to work, you ain't going to pay your bill. You know? I said, man, I'm going to be the first successful crackhead, nigga. I'm going to smoke dope. I'm going to, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to show y'all nigga how to do this. This is Momo. This is Momo. Yeah, I'm the closest thing to Martin Luther King you going to see on crack. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I smoke, I, I smoke dope like a gentleman. <laughs> you know, with etiquette. With etiquette. Pinky yeah, out everything. Pinky, yeah. So I said, I'm being in front of the Lounge Journey Constitution with a crack pipe like a trophy <laughs> saying, we found him. You know, the first successful crackhead. Yeah, you know, I'm man, because I'm insane, baby. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, man, I tried smoking crack, man, and it lasted for a couple months, you know? Yeah. I was going to work, business, you know? Yeah, man, I was being a, a, a functional crackhead, you know? <laughs> and, man, I met around and, and uh, starts. Man, around and stopped going away. And I saw, so I saw Jaws sent me to a rehab, man. I went to the rehab just to save my jaw. <laughs> yeah, you not, not stop. To stop no. <laughs> so they gave us some an abuse, so I couldn't drink. So we went to an outpatient, you know, in Clifton Spring, right there on Flash Old Parkway, right, right, Clifton right. Road, uh -huh. right there. So that was my first time being introduced to 12 step program, uh, NACA, whatever. So I just went to save my job. I yeah. was working at Georgia Duck, you know, this rubber factory over in uh, Avondale. Okay. So, man, you know, my daughter, you know, she she uh, she about eight years old. And I, so uh, I started smoking crack. So, man, uh, so all I did was just wait to, the, to count the day where the antibuse going to wear off. You know, the antibuse, you, if you drink some alcohol, you'll throw up. So I was just counting the day. So I went through that 30 day program. Yeah. And then I, hey man, went right back to drinking, smoking. Wide open. Wide open, man. Smoking like a broke stove, man. <laughs> so from 89, so from 89 to 99, I was getting high. You know? From 89 to 99. Not 89 to 90. No. <laughs> 89 to 90. No, I'm, yeah. I'm an aggressive smoker. <laughs> Man, yeah, I don't, I don't, the only time I stopped smoking when I got some handcuffs on me. <laughs> I, 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 you, you yeah, I ain't never been on no nigga gonna smoke for two days and go back home. <laughs> nah, bro, I gotta get some handcuffs on me. I gotta, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I gotta get locked up. I'm gonna be the best. Yeah, cause I was trying to smoke, <laughs> you know, and I realized in 99, man, you know, uh, my first wife, she took me to a um, 12 step me. Mm -hmm. And so I went, and uh, so I got like a year in 99, to, I stopped in 99 and I made it to 2002. I ain't even pick up a white chip cause my first wife, she'd go to the meetings and sit there and say, well, what was the topic and all that? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, she was she was a sweet lady, Jean. So anyway, man, I ended up uh, in 02 getting a brand new Monte Carlo from Tom Jumper. I worked at General, I started working at General Motors in 99. Making good money. Making $30 an hour. My sponsor, my NA sponsor who worked at General Motors, he had like 20 years at the time. So I go to my 12 step meeting, the inside out group, cause life is an inside job. Right. That's why they named the NA inside out group. That's my home group. So I go to the meeting and uh, he give me this paper application for General Motors. So I started working at General Motors in, in 99, 2000. And I worked and uh, worked to 2002. And then I relapsed. I relapsed because all the promises started coming true. And then I went and got a brand new Monte Carlo. And uh, got a Monte Carlo in May. Smoked crack all of June. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I ain't even call in, I was so high. <laughs> All of June. All of June in that brand new Monte Carlo. I forgot about God, everybody. Yeah. Fresh. Fred, baby. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? In that Monte Carlo. And all of June, I'm getting high, relapse. And so in July of July 1st of 2002, I'm in a high speed chase from the police on uh, ML King and Burbank. In the Monte Carlo. In the Monte Carlo, going 150. I ain't even driving. I got one dope boy driving. <laughs> and uh, he high on powder and I'm high on crack. Been up 10 days. He come out of uh, 
Burbank flying and go through the red light and a Ford Explorer come and T-bone us and I'm knocked out. So I'm laying on the middle of the floor or uh, on the street at ML King Burbank by uh um Anderson Park. Okay, yeah, Cascade. I know exactly where you at. Yeah. What's that? Uh, Mosley Park. Mosley Park. Right there. So I'm laying down, man, and I'm I see him cut my shirt off, man. I see this light, man. And I wake up in Grady Hospital. That when you were born? July right? of 02. Born in Grady. And Grady saved my life, man. I'm in Grady Hospital for a whole month. For the whole month of uh, July. Whole month of July. I get out August 2nd. And uh, got collapsed lung, pulmonary embolism, everything. And I uh, like to die. And I got tubes in my chest and my lung, collapsed lung, everything. They told them to call everything. And um, so from, uh, you know, 2000, I get out of the hospital. Like to die. You would think I would change. I did. You, yeah, you did. No, I didn't. Start back smoking <laughs> crack again in 2003 in April. Right back to it. Right back to it. Don't win about another Monte Carlo. Fresh Still again. at General Motors, yeah. And uh, I took my wheel back. Took my wheel back, man. You know, and I speak about choices because choices are free, consequences are costly. You make good choices, you might get some good consequences. Mm. Bad choices, you're going to get bad consequences. Mm. So in 2003, man, I started bad smoking. Right. Started bad smoking. And I was up like 14 days one time, and I'm going down. Uh, I'm on. I'm on uh, Boulder Crest at 285, and I'm going to uh, Flat Show Parkway, and I'm going 120 miles an hour, and I've been up about 14 days, and I fall asleep at the wheel. You up 14 days in a row. 14 in a row. God damn, that's strong ass drug. 14 days in a row. 14 in a row drinking MD. Uh, Alize, me with a uh, mad dog and some bar and gin. The cheapy, the look of the best. You know what I mean? Cause yeah. if I, well, you know, when I smoke dope and I ain't, I ain't drunk, then I can't even talk. You ask me something, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you couldn't even talk. Yeah, so you know, man, I hit yeah, that look, man. I hit that look, man, and I'm, and I'm clear my throat and I'm down, you know. But I, man, I fall asleep at the wheel going 120 miles an hour on Flash Old Parkway in 285 and running the back of a, uh, of a uh, Jeep Cherokee. I wake up, the engine done fell down, the airbags done exploded out, man. You know what I mean? You got, you got, you got antifreeze all on the on thing. I get out and look at the car, man, and I grab my crack pipe and my MD ball, and I run up the off-ramp, you know, and helicopters and everything, they circling and everything. I done jumped down in the bush because I'm going to one dope boy house, apartment to get him, supposedly. And I remember crawling all through the woods and stuff like, you know what I'm saying, like I'm in the army, you know what I'm yeah. saying? I'm down there, you know what I'm saying? I done went up on the fence and got to his apartment. And the bad thing was that, you know, my mom and my first wife, they come and see the car. And they see, you know, some days before that I had got into it with a dope boy. He had shot through my window. So, you know, the bullet went straight through my seat. I wasn't in the car. Oh, yeah, okay. man, right there on Moreland in 285, that hotel sit up on the hill. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, that, you know, I had gotten into a little something with the boy, you know, one of the dope boys. Yeah. So they think our nigga on dope, you know what I mean? They can talk to him any kind of way. They call me a J. I said, yeah, nigga, I might be the J, but I'm J not to fuck with. I whoop your ass. Yes, yeah, so I put that thing on. <laughs> you, know that, you know when church chicken was 99 cents, yeah. you get two pieces? Yeah. I put something on his ass like that church of chicken nine, that 99 cents, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I hit him with that doubt. And, and he got mad, man, you know, and his friend ribbed him up. Yeah. So when I came back in the hotel, you know, in my car, he saw me. He ran around there and somebody gave him a gun. They didn't know they were getting him gun for me. And they said, who I'm getting you the gun for? They said, Momo. And they said, oh, they tried to grab him. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, and that's God. Yeah. Because he shot my car up. I was in the room and um, I saw him and, and uh, he shot my car up, man. And then, um, you know, my mom then found the car you know, with a bullet hole in it and, you know, and, and, and they like lost it. So those are the consequences of me making that bad charge of smoking crack. Mm -hmm. 
And then, you know, in 02, then I got caught with a chopper on, um, so I went and got a Tahoe, you know, on them Giovanni on 24. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, so you I went up high. Yeah, yeah, I had to own them fold. This here back in 04, 05. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I got. Popular back then. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm on them Giovanni. You know, me and Young Jock, we the only one got them fold, baby. Them <laughs> Giovanni. Yeah. 10 stacks. 10 stacks. That you got them. Got them from, uh, got them from, um, over there in Buckhead, um, that rim place, um, can't think of it right now. But long story short, I'm riding good. You know what I mean? I'm riding good. And uh, I'm still dibbling dabbing, you know. Yeah. And a cat and a cat stole my rim. I had the lawn hearts first on the Tahoe. Uh -huh. Had that old two Tahoe. I had the lawn hearts first, and dudes had uh, stole my rims off of it, right? So I went and got the the, the folds. Then you know, yeah. You so upgrade. I, went, I upgraded and went and got them folds, man. And uh, you know, and uh, so I go purchase some 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 choppers for. My dope boy, you know what I'm saying, my boy. Now oh, I mean, you did it for him? Yeah, he bought two of them, you know what I'm saying? My boy Billy bought two of them, so he got one, I got one, you know? So we riding with the choppers on the seat and everything, but when they stole my lawn horse off of there, and so we went and got went and got the chopper, and we had put 60 rounds in that thing, but now the clip taped it up and everything, man. So we down there waiting on dude, you know, you know, so 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 at the time his girlfriend was a witness to a murder. Oh, okay. So the, the ATF all of them already in the woods right there watching the girl go in the building, in the apartment. Yeah. So, you know, you know Whitehall Far, yeah. right there at 285, Boulder Crest. So when they when 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 they beat on the door, we in now and they come through the door. Cause we look out the top one and see him, but he let them in. He got the rifles, he got everything out, man, up on the bed, dope, everything. They said, we ain't come here for no dope, no guns, and then we looking for her. So they was looking for this girl named Red, man. So uh, they come in there, they couldn't find Red. So they end up taking me, and I had the paperwork to the rifles. Mm. They end up taking me, and they told me, you know, at the time now, this is 05, August. My wife pregnant with my son. Mm. She eight months pregnant. He born September 3rd. And so she, uh, the police them locked me up. They locked me up. And so I ended up, you know, doing like 48 hours in, the, in, in jail, 48 hours, and they came and let me out. Mm. And he, I was like, man, he said, let me tell you something. He said, when we came in, y'all was in DeKalb County. He said, when we came in here, I had five of my correction officers tell me who you were. He said, man, they said you a hell of an athlete. So guy from Price High, Carver High, Fulton High, East Atlanta High School, Bass High, all these guys I played against were telling the officer, man, that, dude, that's Momo. You know, man, he come from a good family. Man, he's a hell of a, one of the best athletes ever come through here. And that's why I want to speak by favor. You know, favor ain't fair. You know, and life is about relationship. Yeah. You know, the old guy couldn't, they ain't had to speak up for me like that. All right. But the, all, the, the detective came and let me out, man, by four in the morning and uh, in the Cal County, right on Moreland, uh, Memorial Drive. And he said, man, I'm going to let you out. I know you about to have a child. He said, but don't come back and get these rifles. Promise me that. Mm. And I'm going to let you go. And he let me go. Mm. And um, that was... Uh, that was uh, August of uh, 05. And so when I got out, man, you know, cause when I smoked crack, man, I pawned everybody car. I had two cars from pawn one time, one neither one of them, man. It was my <laughs> wife, pawning. my wife and my mom car. You pawning they stuff. On Del Mar. You pawning. I'm pawning. I gotta get this money. Gotta get this dope. <laughs> I money. smoke the car. <laughs> I ain't no money. I'm smoking it. Man, you know, and I, it's good I can make fun of that today yeah. because, you know, in 05, in August, I was diagnosed with cancer. Mm. So when I went to Kaiser to my to my uh, therapist and my rehab folks, they asked me was I having any stomach pains. And I had been having stomach pain for years. You know, bleed not the rectum, everything, but I kept smoking that dope and it stopped hurting. So when they asked me that, I went and got the colonoscopy done. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
and I re and I found out I had a uh, tumor. And I had to have uh, surgery at Northside Hospital uh, August, August 18th of 05. Mm. And uh, I had that surgery. Matter of fact, let me see, August, September, October, November. I had the surgery in November. Okay. Yeah. My son was born September. My sobriety date October the 10th. 05. I left my son and my wife at the hospital when he was born. Cause I got a cousin, Larry J, who birthday on September the third, like my son. Mm -hmm. He was having a barbecue and I left the hospital. And my wife was like, you know you ain't coming back, you start drinking. I said, Yes, I am. And man, uh my son born September third, my sobriety day to October the tenth. I stayed gone a month. And so I had a, hey, gone a month. I had a dope boy to come up to me. I still had the armband on. Somebody that I raised yeah. from over in Thomasville in uh, Lila Valley. He was like, hey, man, I looked up to you, man, all through high school and everything, playing sport. Now, this dude selling dope. And he said, man, did you just have a son, Mo? I said, yeah. He said, well, what the hell are you still over here for? Mm. He said, you ain't like them. Man, Joker pulled that big old 45 out. He said, man, I see you over here tomorrow. It's going to be me and you. He gave me a 50 piece. He said, oh, man, take the hill. It was like 8 at night. He said, I'll be on see you in the morning. And the light went off on my head, in my head that I had a problem. Up until then, man, for 10 years, man, I was in denial. Man, you, you know, the 10 years I worked for General Motor, I only worked the last five in the plant for a whole year. The first five, I worked six months and go in rehab for six months. I never did make a whole year, man. Mm. So I ended up uh, having surgery in November, 05, man, and they had colonoscopy. And I actually prayed with a sincere heart. I wasn't locked up. Cause why be locked up? I had three mm. lotteries for drugs from the same hotel in the same month. Damn. And when they caught me that time, man, they locked me up. I had to do, I did. They gave me 60 days to do 45. Hmm. Yeah. And a guy who was uh, one of the correction guys, he was like, hey, man, you Douglas Smith? And I was like, on the intercom, I was like, yeah. And he was like, Mo Mo. I was like, yeah, man. I said, man, when am I going to get out of here? Got the phone from General Motors and I called telling me I can get my job back, but I'm locked up. Yeah. And, man, uh, I ended up doing 30 days and getting out. But I had that surgery, man. I just prayed to God. Sincerely. Sincere prayer. That, Lord, if you help me this time, I'll be the best son, best husband, best father, best brother, best employee, best recovering addict. And man, after some four hours surgery, I looked up at that IV, man, and I saw that, that IV dripping. And I said, look at you, God, you did it again. And gave me another chance, man, and I ain't looked back. That was 10-10-05 that was when I surrendered my life to Christ. And also, November, I had about a month clean mm. when I was diagnosed with the tumor. And uh, man, uh, after that surgery, man, I ain't looked back, man. You know, 17 plus years. 17. I just celebrated 17 years clean and sober by grace of God, man. And I didn't. And people say, how did you stop? I said, man, I ain't stopped. I was delivered. It's a different, man. You know, cause when you been, when you did being delivered, man, it bring about accountability. Yes. Sir. Yeah. And see, my relationship with God is so strong that I'm accountable to God. Every day I open my, God open my eyes up, man. I don't need no alarm clock. God open my eyes up. I'm so grateful to him yeah. for giving me the opportunity and giving me new life. Because I have, I had my first daughter when I was 19. I had my second daughter when I was 41. Mm. Had my son when I was 42. Mm. So my two kids, my two young kids ain't never seen me high. They ain't never seen me with a beer in my hand. I'm 59 years old, and I just told them about three years ago about my past. Right. And they can't believe it. They can't believe it. 
they can't believe that I was on crack cocaine and I was a uh, alcoholic and I uh, went through all that stuff. And uh, one thing about it, I smoked crack for 13 years. But the grace is, like Shaq, Rap, Meshach, and the Bendigo. Yeah. Man, the grace is, when they came out of that fire and furnace, they ain't smell like smoke. The grace is for me being on dope for 13 years. I don't look like what I've been through. Mm. I don't smell like no dope either. Yeah. You know, and that that grace, man. You know, and I try to give people hope. My acronym of hope is helping others persevere every day. Mm. Cause you know, I work for Silver Atlanta, Center of, of Hope. You know, Kasim Reed, Mayor Reed had started the Centers of Hope when we partnered with Boys and Girl Club. You know, and I looked at that word hope, man, and and that's all I do, man. I'm a hope pusher. Yeah. I don't push dope, I push hope. Yeah. And you know, hope is helping others persevere every day. You know, and I wear this shirt, peace. You know, my acronym at peace is positive energy allows constant elevation. Yeah. You know, and and, and, and dealing with relationships, you want to have positive people around you so they can elevate you. Right. You know, constant means all the time. Right. You know, constant is all the time, you know, and elevate means to go into a higher level. And the level we go into is a spiritual level. It's not no religious level. Right. Spiritual, man, is a... Uh, the whole spirit is our conscience, you know, and our conscience just make a conscious decision. Right. You know, you think about before you do it. And ever since I started thinking about my wife, my kids, my parents, I started thinking about others. My life has gotten greater. Right. Because I don't think about me no more, about selfish thoughts. And, you know, I think about how to affect others. And meaning my wife, my kids, my grandkids. I got grandkids. Right. I got a granddaughter, 19. She's a sophomore at North Carolina a and And I have a grandson who's in the 10th grade in high school. And he played basketball. And uh, so my daughter, Shatiri, man, you know, my oldest child, she's 41. She's, 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 she's me and our relationship is so powerful. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, because everything I put in her, same way my mama poured into me that, you know, that trust, that, uh, whatever she have a situation, I talk to, talk to her about it, you know. Right. Yeah, so, uh, you know, life about relationship. I ask people all the time, have you ever seen a U-Haul behind a hearse? Mm. It's going to be like trying to blow a bubble with a nine lady. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> whatever you, it ain't the race, it's the journey. Mm-hmm. Having meaningful conversation with people. Yeah. And, you know, whatever our struggle is somebody else's hope. Our struggle is somebody else's hope. Right. Whatever God allow you to go into, whatever bad decisions you made, God bring you out, it's going to be somebody that needs you to tell them, how did you get through that? Right. Yeah. So our struggle is somebody else's hope. And Constantly on a daily basis, man, I understand, man, I'm moving in my purpose today. Yeah. After my surgery, the Dr. Lucius came in my room and gave me the book, The Purpose Driven Life. And in the preface, it said, it's no coincidence that you're reading this book. And boy, I said, wow. I like this. Yeah. <laughs> so for 40 and 40, baby. Yeah. It's in the Bible, 40 days and 40 nights. Yeah. So that book is 40 and 40. 40 chapters. I read a chapter a day. It took me to another spiritual level. See, people, see, I, my, one of my favorite quotes I use is, those that judge don't matter. Those that matter don't judge. Mm. Those that judge don't matter. Those that matter don't judge. See, I spent a lot of my life people pleasing. I ain't want nobody to feel like I thought I was better than them. Right. And it ain't got nothing to do with money. I learned the spiritual life, man, is priceless. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? To be spiritually mature. Because trust me, every day, uh, look, I took the Bible from General Motors. It wasn't nobody, and I had three years clean. It wasn't nobody, me and the mail about, me and the mailman and, and that $75,000 check. That was my chance to smoke like a broke stove. That was it. Get what I did. What? I went straight to SunTrust and deposited that check. Now, that was a time I could have cashed that whole, I could have put by whatever in there and kept me by 10 stacks, huh? And been like, Martin, woo, woo, woo. <laughs> huh? When it, when it bought me by 10 scrape shooters, yeah. huh? And some Brillo, huh? And a blowtorch, huh? And a key. 
Locked in. Man, come on, man. I'd have been dead. Yeah. See, God had another plan for me. And that is, you know, to spread the word, man. You know, to give them other people that don't have no hope, don't have no encouragement to say, man, you know what? If God did it for me, he'll do it for you. Because, see, God is no respect of a person. The same thing he did for me, he'll do for you. You, you, he'll do for anybody else. The same thing he did for me. Mm -hmm. And this ain't nothing about religion. It got everything to do about being that spiritual man. All right. Because a spiritual man going to make a conscious decision before he do anything. Because it's almost like saying, what would God do? All right. Yeah. So, man, my life today is great, man. You know, and... um you know, we do the mayor implement the midnight basketball league for our players, for those young men and young adults over at, in the community that we can uh, bring them in, you know, and that's what this is. Yeah, tell, tell us a little season bit about one, you. Season one, season two, You got season three, three championships. But it's, only been going, it's only been going on for the last three years, ain't it? No, nah, last, no, the last year. The last two years. You got we done three combined three. Yeah, we done combined three seasons. Yeah, in, you got in, three championships in, in a row. Less than two years. Yeah, we so, got three in a row. So talk a little bit about the league and also talk about how somebody wanted to join the league or be a part of it. You know what I mean? Where does it take place? How can they maybe join a team? You know, the competitive level. Uh, you coach a team. You yeah. won three three years in a row. Uh, you know, somebody was to look to get on your team. Now, they got to be the butt neck in there. Oh, yeah. You, you can't, can't get on my to... team. Yeah, I don't need no guards. If you're a big, come see me. You 6'6", six, six, come yeah, see yeah. me. You remember I was trying to get yeah, you to you find somebody. Yeah, you big guy, yeah. But, you know, it's from 18 to 28 years old, and we play all games on Wednesday and Thursday nights at uh, C.T. Martin Recreation Center, the formerly Adamville Rec Center. First game start at 8, last game at 12. We usually play five games every night. Um, you, can, you, can, you can get a team and bring them in, you know, get 10 guys and bring them in within that age limit, 18 to 28. Or you can contact uh, Raimondo Davidson with the city of Atlanta, and he'll, he'll let you know what team needs some people, and they'll add on. Uh, but um, – you know, it's all about the community. We have Chick-fil-A. We have uh, Amazon. We have a lot of different uh, companies there, uh, you know, taking the application. We do expungements there. Uh, we have uh, free haircuts, everything free. We have food vendors, mm. food trucks, mm. everything. The mayor, Greg Street, uh, com the commissioner will be there, uh, Cutler, um, Justin Cutler, also our city councilwoman, Andrea Boone, for uh, councilwoman for District 10, she's there. So we got a lot of support. Even the mayor, Andre Dinkins, he be there all the time. So how much, if say I wanted to bring my own team, how much would it be for me to enter a team? Like, what's the what's the price? Free. So it's free, to, so it's for y'all heard that, get, so it's free, you it's get, free to you register. You get your player, you, get your you register. Player. Do you have to provide you your own jerseys? Nope, city give you jerseys as well. City give you jerseys as well. You know, we got, uh, when you first come to the game that night, you show them your ID. They hold your ID. They give you your jersey and your pants. And then after the game, you give them back uh, the jersey pants. They give you back your ID. Now, now, and now. then you go get you a Chick-fil-A sandwich and some fries. Now, 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 I don't know if we want to put this out to everybody. Because now, if we put this out to the South Side, and because I'm going to tell you like this, like you got trade. See, they don't like when folk like the South Side come to the West Side. It get kind of murky. So, if we come out there, you might not win your four, Momo. You might be stuck at three because we're we giving it to two. We're giving too many people too much flavor. Free league. Free Chick Fil A, free fries, free haircuts, free, free chicken. Free head, come on, Amazon applications, jerseys free. That's too much flavor for the for the city of Atlanta to get that didn't even know about it. You give it to them uncut, man. Them folk gonna be there, and now the competition gonna rise, Momo. You might not like that. But you know what I'm saying? We need a challenge. So uh, <laughs> all you guys who watch who got team, come join the league. Cause can't nobody beat us right now. And you know what I mean? I made decision in real time. You know, this here ain't no coincidence. <laughs> yeah. I didn't slip on no banana and get these. You know what I'm saying? I got I got seven players that can give me 20 any day. Any day. Any day. You understand? And then I got a big man that gonna control the middle. You know, it's time we was down. I don't coach players. I coach life. 
I teach them, hey, man, we down by 15, get what? They ain't making no adjustment. We finna make adjustment. It's just like coming outside, get ready to go to work, and your tie flat. What you gonna do, get back in the bed, call in, or you gonna call AAA, or you gonna fix that tie? That's an adjustment. Yeah. Huh? Uh, you can't take a shower. You can't take a shower because the hot water heater done went out. What you gonna do? Huh? You ain't gonna take a bath or you gonna get that hot water heater fit? Them are adjustments in life. I make adjustments. And one thing, it ain't never over till God says it's over. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And there again, we are down and I tell them, don't give up. And we done came back and won games. Our championship game, the semi game, we was down 15, 13 at halftime. Came back, came back and won 91 89. So it was all about, you know, making adjustment. It's life. It's more to the game than the game. That's all I can say. It's more to the game than the game. Because bringing more competition, they ain't going to do but help the lead. Yeah, you know, that's and that's fact. what we want to do. We want to help fact. the lead, more the merrier, and we need a challenge. Cause yeah. you know, right now can't nobody beat us. See when the south, see when the south side get out, get out. So you know, south side get out two eighty five. The, the the fat lady start whistling. She start singing. She do. She ah, she start singing when the south side get. You know what I'm saying? We bring that south side to 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 old Adamville. So west fat lady and gonna east start, too. You know, we play games gonna start at Rosedale. Whistling. She gonna start singing before we get off before we get off MLK and make that left in the CT. Yeah. Right before Allen Temple, she might start singing. You might have some play. How North feel you play? They might not show up. We tell them we coming. Well, the thing is that regardless if they show up or not, if I'm not a coach, then that's a, hey, man, that half of the battle. You know what I mean? Because one thing I do know, you know, I played the game on a high level and I coached the game on a high level. Because one thing about me, my lifestyle, my lifestyle, you know what I'm saying, it, you, you hang around me long enough, it's going to resonate in you. You know, my spirit going to jump in you. You know, so I, I'm a motivator, man. I, 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 I motivate the, the, the unreachable. I reach the unreachable. See, it's something to be certified by God. Yeah. Because there ain't too many people over at my, over by my rec center that can go uh, up at that store by the rec center, CT, by Allen Rec Center, yeah. and push a, a catering cart up there and, and, and issue out some hot dogs and some poking beans, yeah. and nobody don't try to jump him and kill him. Because yeah. the fact is, you know, you know the thing about Coach Doug, I get it. Coaches get a pass in the hood. Yeah. And I let them know, I've been there where y'all been, bro. I used to smoke dope. I used to be on the corner asking for, for a dollar on Boulevard over in Fort Ward, over in Tomerville, you know what I mean? Over in the Valley, over in Lila Valley. I only smoke dope everywhere. Elay Meadow, Barn Home, you name it. I done been there, mm. and I and, and, and guys done put guns on me and everything. And I had guys who I played ball again that saved my life. Mm. You know, say, man, put that gun down, man. I know him, that Momo. You know, so if you don't know Momo, you don't know Martin Luther King. Dang. And that the God him true. <laughs> hey, let me tell you something. If you don't know Momo, man, you don't know Martin Luther King. Because Black History Month at my high school, they ain't talk about Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, Vanna Holyfield, none of them cats, man. What they talked about? They talk about Douglas Momo Smith. <laughs> and that the, hey, that's the real deal because one thing about it, I ain't bragging, but I know what I know. Yeah. And I put in the work, man. And not only that, man, the awards that I got in sports can't touch the awards that God has given me today. You know, God, uh, 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 the spirit, the whole spirit God has given me, the new life God has given me, man, it don't come with an expiration date. I tell everybody, man, don't never say what you won't do. You just say yet. Because you know what yet means you're eligible to. I mm. don't mm. understand that word yet. Yeah. See, I said I ain't never, hey, man, I ain't never, uh, I hear people say, I ain't never smoke crack. I ain't never fire bank rust. I ain't never uh, have foreclosed home. Guess what? In 2008, I had three years clean. And I went through foreclosed home. Represent Tahoe and bankruptcy. Clean. Clean. I caught more hair clean than I did when I was on dope. And because I could you feel the pain. Back. Yeah, I could have went back, but you I was did. so grateful to God and what God did when I stayed the path. So you could feel the pain. I could feel the pain. It hurt, man. And move back with my parents, me, my wife, my two kids. Stay with my parents for six years. Mm. And Moved across the street, rented a house across the street for four years. We lost it all in 2008. My wife and I, my wife, I took the bow from General Motors. My wife used to work for the people made the seat for General Motors. My wife, April. And guess what? We lost it all. 
Mm. Moved back with my parents in 2008. 2018, I went, I started working with the city in 2012. Started working, driving shuttle bus at the airport 2013. For six years, I worked that second job to put my wife through school. Now my wife is an echo technician, making $45. If she do a contract, she making stupid money. Stupid money. Yeah. I say all that to say in 2018, we lost it all in 2008. 2018, God gave it all back to us. A seven bedroom house, 6,000 square feet. Ooh. The house we lost was probably about two, 3,000 square feet. A yeah, ranch on dub, full. Yeah, a ranch on an unfinished basement, three bedroom. But I say all that to say, look at God. Look at it. I could have gave up. Yeah. But, you know, like my documentary, Surrender to Win, I surrender my life to Christ. And ever since then, I caught hell now. I caught hell. But that's life. That life. You're going to catch hell. Yeah. But what I realized is that my life been like camel soup. Mm mm, good. Ever since I surrendered my life to Christ. <laughs> Amen. For anybody out there in this, in this world that haven't tried Jesus, that don't mean you got to know all these scriptures because I don't know but two. Ephesians 2.10 say you can't get to heaven by your work called man of boast. And I was one of them men. Because I thought I was a exceptional crackhead, you know. Mm. And uh, God told me that when I had that white linen suit on with the P. Diddy chain, the thousand dollar chain when I worked for General Motors, and I had on them gators, and in 14 days that white linen suit was a uh, brown. The P. Diddy chain was gone. Mm. The Tahoe I had pawned it. And, I, I, and God said, man, son, you're just another addict looking for me. And so I realized that, you know, God is, you know, that answer. So in my favorite scripture, and every man or woman should have a scripture that pertain to their life. Mine is 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that says, Therefore, if any man and woman is in Christ, you are a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. God regulated my mind, cleaned my heart, and renewed my spirit. I ain't the same person I was. Mm. 10, 10, 05, baby. Indeed. Matter of fact, I ain't the same person I was yesterday. Because every day that old person, you got to chip away at him. Because he going to check back in with you. Yeah, he going to knock. Old crack man yeah, come he back. He going to knock. Old crack man come back. Yeah. Hey, Mo, you want to try some dope? I got what I said. for free. Thanks for sharing. But I'm going to go with Jesus. Because my gratitude is my attitude. Every day, I let my gratitude be my attitude. I'm grateful to God. That's such a beautiful, beautiful journey. Like you said, the, the journey that you've been through is, is so so uh, touching. And it's, 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 uh, it's beautiful because it's real and it's authentic and it, and it shows both sides of the coin. Like I like, it's a bad, life is a balance. Yeah. So many people think that you go through life and it's all cookies and, and rainbows and, and, and beauty and, and then you die. And, yeah. and, 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 and so many people go through things similar, you know what I mean? Or even like trials and tribulations, tri uh, you know, tribulations where you go peaks and valleys Yeah. and people don't share those peaks and valleys because everybody wants to, Appear Come perfect. across, yeah. You know what I mean? And so when you give people that authenticity and you give them that uncut, people start, they can relate more because they go, you know what? Maybe I didn't go through the same exact situation as you went through, but I can, you know, I can, I can, I can recognize where, you know, where my valleys and his valleys may have crossed right. paths and, and, and how he's, how he's uh, navigated and how he's come out of it and, 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 and how he's inspiring me. Right. To stand up for myself and believe in myself and, and, and persevere. And, and that's what, and that's the, that's what the, 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 uh, the solution is. Yeah. Is that I can only keep what I have by giving it away. Mm. And people say, why you always tell folk about you was on crack? If I don't, then I, you won't see the goodness in God and what he did for me. So if I don't tell you what, that, that, that what I went through, 
then you'll just look at me and be thinking, hey, man, you know, this guy got it going on. You know, I ain't been through that because right. I don't look like what I've been through. Right. But in all that's not, in all reality is, you know what? I've been to hell on earth. Right. On crack for 13 years. Yeah. Man, I done had gun pulled on me. You know what I'm saying? I done uh, 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 fell to sleep with some people. I ain't really know they done put some Visine in my liquor or yeah, beer and yeah. stuff. You know, they didn't kill me. Yeah. They probably just took some money out of my pocket, whatever they did. But I don't have situations right. that uh, I know it was God there. Right. You know, God protecting me and covering me, you know, through my mom's prayers. And, you know, and, and, and so I understand, man, you know, we can only have, keep what we have by giving away. And that is telling our story. Because can't nobody tell your story like you. Yeah. Because our struggle is somebody else's hope. You telling somebody your story can help them right. save their lives. Right. And so that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to give people hope, man. He wants us to encourage people. And he wants us to be, uh, show them the fruit of the Spirit, man. And that's what I do, man. I give them the uncut version. I tell them what happened to me. My bad choice of smoking crack cocaine. Going to jail, you know, falling asleep at the wheel, man, getting shot at and all that stuff. But I'm still here because God had another plan. Right. Now, as we wrap it up, I would, I would like to ask you three last questions. One, what would you tell your, what would you tell younger Momo? What advice? And not lengthy, just a, a few words of advice. If you came across something, what would you tell younger Momo? And, 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 and. I understand that you have to go through things to grow through things. Yeah. Because that's how I am. Yeah. So I would tell my younger self, hey, we're gonna, it's going to work out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But take that, take that component out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Take yeah. the component out that, that, that in order for you to, to get where you are now, you had to go through those trials and tribulations. Let's try to remove that and just go, okay, if I were to see him, I would give him this piece of advice because there might be a young, uh, you know, young guy that, yeah, yeah, that 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 may need that right. little piece of advice. What what would that be? It would be, go with your heart. Mm. Go with your heart. Go with what you what you love. You know, uh, you know, don't don't go to a school if you come down to a decision, a crossroad where you got to make a choice on a school, or uh, you know, a sport. Go with the sport that you love the best and go with go to the school that wants you the best, the most, where you're the number one on their list. Mm. It's just like a draft. Right. When you're getting recruited, they got this guy, you know, at this position, that's who they want. That's their number one overall pick. Right. You know, so I'll just tell any young Momo, hey, man, always go with your heart. And, you know, and always make the best choice. Not necessarily a personal choice, but make the choice that's going to be more suitable for you as an individual person, you know, that, that that relationship you build with whoever that person is that recruiting you, you know, they're going to gonna make you feel uh, where you can reach your most potential at. Right. My second question is, what makes life beautiful? What makes life beautiful, man, is joy, not money. Happiness come and go, but joy. Because happiness is external. Joy is internal. Mm. See, life is an inside job. Mm. So you got to be comfortable with who you are. So you got more people paying attention to others than they is themselves. Mm -hmm. So once you learn who you are, then you'll be able to grow and help other people. Right. You know, so joy it's internal. And you hear a lot of old people say, the world didn't give me joy and they can't take it away. Mm. See, man, joy, man, joy, it, and it's priceless. Anytime, anytime you can capture something that you can't put a price on, you, you, you're doing something. See, I got joy yeah. and you can't put a price on this joy. Right. You know, and I, I'm filled with the whole spirit. Man, you can't put a price on this hill. You can't put a price on my life right now. Right. You know, my life worth trillions. It more than, you can't even put a price on where I'm at today. Right. Yeah, because of the joy that God has given me. It's priceless. The new life, man, it's priceless, man. Anytime you can't figure it out, you're down. Mm. My third question is, being, being, being an a, a, a Atlanta native like myself and like you are, 
we are privy or, or we, we've come across numerous of sayings mm -hmm. the older generation that we might have heard, you know what I mean? Just little slick shit that we just don't heard just yeah. in passing. Right. What's your favorite saying? You know what I'm saying? Just, you know, what's your favorite little slick saying that you heard growing up? You said, man, that's fine. I got to take that. Oh, man. <laughs> when Joe, I heard Joe say, tell me something slick so I can slide. <laughs> when I heard that cat say that, man, I said, man, tell me something slick so I can slide. And, um, you know, in Atlanta, man, but, you know, my favorite said, why settle for less when you can have more, more? That's tough. Oh, yeah, why settle for less when you can have <laughs> more, more? <laughs> yeah. You say so good you got said yeah, twice. I got, yeah, man, I, I had to roll with that, man. <laughs> But one thing I do want to touch on before we leave is the difference in Atlanta back then when I grew up and now. And that new, new Atlanta. New Atlanta. Is, even New Atlanta from, from me to now is yeah. different. Yeah. I don't even know what this is. Yeah. And so, you know, the old Atlanta was more family-based. Community. Community. You know, you said, man, oh, man, I'm from Fort Ward. Oh, man, I'm from Pittsburgh. Oh, man, I'm from Center Hill. Mm. Oh, man, I'm from whatever, Jackson yeah. Parkway. Uh, you know, you know, I'm from Ely Meadow. Right. You know what I'm saying? I'm from Lee Levada. I'm from Four Seasons. Right. Man, you know, the community, man, ain't no more grandmamas no more, man. Yeah. Ain't no grandmama 35. 35. You go into a restaurant now, they don't even look at you. I, I, no. When I was young, you, you always opened doors for women. You always opened doors for yeah. other people. You always spoke. Yeah. Hey, how you, how doing? you doing? Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. None of that. You went about your thing. All the people that might have been doing things that you might not, that might not, from a society standpoint, be. And uh, they not then, trying to bring you in no. with it. Hey, man, you going to play ball. You going to do you this. Go on right. that way. Yeah. No OGs. Yeah, they See, ain't real no more, OGs. Ain't no OGs no more. These dudes here trying to get the young boy to sell the dope for them, trying to get the young boy to rob somebody, trying to get the young boy to go do all that stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because they got it where, you know, teenagers, they you doing like this the to them and everything, and they being used, you know, because... It was a time an older person would tell me to do something, even if they told me to do something wrong, I would see my mom and my granddad and my dad face. Mm. So my choice was I was more afraid of my mama than I was them niggas in the street. Right. She was the gangster. Yeah, so I ain't finna <laughs> I ain't finna go with what you talking about, right. Pineca. I gotta deal with Bernie boy when I get to the house. Right. You know, so you know, the, the new Atlanta, it just ain't got, we don't have no, we don't have no, we don't have no uh, strength in the culture and, and, and the, um, the older ones, you know, making the kids accountable. Right. Because the kids ain't accountable no more. Yeah. See, they ain't accountable no more. Because when you got in trouble in school, you know you were going to have to see your dad, your mama, somebody, grandmama going to get you. Yeah. They can get in trouble in school, don't even go to school, and ain't nobody going to check to see what they doing. Right. Because every kid that committing a crime out there today, Guess what? They got a mama, they got a daddy, they got a grandmama, right. a granddad, they got an uncle and auntie that you don't never see on that TV saying, I tried to tell him I would, you know. Right, right, right. Yeah, so so that's what it is, man. This new Atlanta, man, and this new society, period. Not yeah, just in Atlanta, different. all the yeah, other cities different. that... You know, these kids are making too many adult decisions. Right. You know, you got kids shooting other kids over there in um, Atlanta Station. Atlanta Station, you know. And so, and then everybody want to print a T-shirt up. Everybody want to do a visual. Man, it's time out for them visuals. Yeah. It's time out for all that stuff. Yeah. Because until we get into the solution. Right. Ain't nothing going to change. Get what? Right. If nothing changes, nothing changes. Mm. Man, it's insane to keep doing the same thing, expecting different results. Right. Until we get somebody that really going to make a change, then this thing ain't going to change, man. Right. We got to get into the solution. We got to make these people accountable for their actions. If the child do something, he under 18, 17, then the parents need to go to jail. Right. Yeah. Send them to prison. Yeah. Somebody got to be accountable. Somebody or this is accountable. not going to stop, man. Yeah. It is. See, God put us in the room before he blesses us. He put us in the room so we can see how everybody operate. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Because, see, if they knew what we carried, they would latch on to us for the wrong, all for the wrong reason. Yeah. But, see, when God exposes, us, exposes them to us, we got to understand that's who they are. Yeah. Acceptance is key.
to all our problems. That don't mean we gotta like it, yeah. but we gotta accept it. And by life being an inside job, you gotta have faith. My acronym of faith is finding answers in the heart because God know our heart. Peanut butter, baby. Peanut butter. Peanut butter, baby. Spread the peanut butter. <laughs> Look, get rid of your friends that give you jelly. <laughs> That's too much. Because when they walk away from you, you're going to say, what did he say? <laughs> <laughs> but when the Momo give you that peanut butter, baby, <laughs> the thick reach of peanut butter, you're going to be able to spread it for the rest of your life. <laughs> I'll let you, boy. <laughs> well, hey, look. Thank you guys for checking in with the family Chop Shop. Once again, we got the famous Douglas Momo Smith in the building, Fulton High, Ohio State Giants. I want to give a special shout out to GU Hoops for being behind the scenes on the camera. I want to give a special out, I mean, shout out to the, the men in the basketball, the mob, for being one of our sponsors. Special shout out to Straight Shooters for being out here. He helped sponsor one of the shirts that we're going to give you before we leave. He does a podcast himself. Uh, special shout out to HBN, Hustle by Nature. Uh, just wanted to say appreciate to everybody that had anything to do with this project. Uh, we're going to keep it going. This is the first episode. Y'all check back in. We do, we'll come back for the second one. All right, peace. Peace. <laughs>